This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Want to welcome everyone to the Amherst Planning Board meeting on November 4th, 2020, based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending uh, certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, GL 30A, chapter 20, and signed Thursday, chapter, or excuse me, <laughs> Thursday, March 12th, 2020. This planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. So my name is Jack Jumsek, and as a chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at what, 6.34, uh, this meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken as normal. I will not take a roll call. Board members, when you hear your name, called, uh, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then you know place yourselves back on mute. So Maria Chow, here, and myself. I'm here. Tom Long, here. Uh, Andrew McDo McDougall. Here. Doug Marshall. Present. And Jenna McGowan. Here. And Johanna. Here. Newman. Thank you. Uh, board members, if te technical uh, difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily to correct the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let Pam know. Uh, discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if this occurred. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period. And at other appropriate times during the meeting, please be aware the board will not respond to comments during Excuse me. Please be aware that the board will not, will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. That's a little, I'm sorry about that. But if you wish to make a comment during a public comment period, you must join the meeting via Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide and it can be entered into you know, a search by the following link. Pam, as you, know, you have that shown. Great. Yes, uh, I do. The link is also listed on the meeting agenda posted on the town website via the calendar listing for the for this meeting, or you can go to the planning board web page and click on the most recent recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. Please indicate if you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised uh, raise hand button when public comment is solicited. And um, if you have joined the joint uh, the, the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address yourself and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Okay, residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected for the meeting. So with that said, I'm going to go back to our agenda. Uh, in the minutes, what do we have for minutes here? October 21. Okay, I'm pulling those up. Okay, that's in the packet. Janet McGowan made a um, request for an additional sentence. And maybe Pam can pick that up or put that up. Uh, okay, I have I have them up. Uh, so what were... Uh, Janet, do you... Uh, 
I don't know if you have your hand, you your hand raised or not, but. Oh yeah, I could. So I thought that um, the minutes were great. Um, then on page five, they left out um, it, Andrew McDougall's question about um, the site plan review requirement that the lights be turned off at the end of business hours. And so I thought that was kind of important because that's a big issue as we'll see later. And so I just, it, I sent a sentence to Christine, which I could read right now. Do you, is that easier? Yeah. It's on the screen. Sure. Okay, I can't. I have some. <clears throat> so, here. Yeah. yeah, okay, I can barely read that, but. Can you zoom Someone? in on your end, Pam? I know we can do it on our end, but it might be easier for you. I think I need like some kind of. I can read box. it. Yeah, I can read it now. So, it's just that Mr. McDougall asked if the site plan review permit language at section 11.2417 that all site lighting be extinguished after business hours except for safety and security lights was a rule or a guideline so that was i just wanted to put that in because that's going to be that seemed important that, that may have been my comment janet i'm not sure yeah, yeah i'm giving that to you oh you are i didn't yeah. even know I'm sorry, I'm not speaking clearly. Okay, no, I didn't. Because it said Mr. McDougall asked. Wait, I'm sorry, is it Tom? Are you it's Tom, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I believe, but maybe, but maybe, um, maybe Andrew raised it also. I think it's yours, Tom. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm that, that yeah. was yours, Tom. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, does it does it make sense to be adding that comment and not providing what the answer was? Um, I guess that makes sense because I think I remember Christine Brestrup saying she felt like it was a guideline, and then I said I thought it sounded mandatory, but I wanted to look at it some more. I think that was the just. Is that right? Is that what you remember, Doug? I didn't go back and listen. I just had that in my notes. I don't uh, have a clear enough recollection of it, and I just think it doesn't make sense in terms of putting it in the minutes, half of it. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's not really a, res a response. I thought, Christine, I thought you said something back, and then later on um, it says that I, was, I wanted to ponder the section. I think I said, this is Chris Brestrup speaking, I think I said that it was um, something that the planning board needed to look at when they were reviewing the site plan review application. And I um, thought it was a guideline, but that's something that can um, be discussed with the building commissioner who actually is, is here, he's present. Um, so if you wanna discuss that now, or if you wanna discuss that when, um, when the Emily Dickinson Museum case is being considered, I guess you could do it either time. But I believe I said I thought it was it was a criterion that the planning board needed to look at um, during their review. I felt it was a guideline, but there may be more. It may be more regulatory than that. And then I guess if we add that in, and then it explains why I'm pondering later in the minutes <laughs> at the at the um, the end like. There's something where it says, Ms. McGowan added she would like to look at other lights downtown and take some time to ponder section 11.2417. So I think I think if you put Christine's response in that it all, it kind of makes sense. It's like, you don't want to do a transcript, but it's an important issue. And I definitely, we're going to be looking at that tonight. Okay, so we're just trying to get these minutes now. Oh approved and I'm a little bit confused um, with where you know what you know what section we're looking at here but um, yeah we're on page five where we're talking about the Emily Dickinson lighting um, and the kind of like what the board was talking about like the conversation that we had Jack Mr. Marshall has his hand raised oh, okay Doug I'd like to make a motion that we table this conversation and have Janet work with Chris and Pam on 
bringing back a complete okay. proposal to the next meeting. Second. Okay. Um, any yeah, comment? I can help you out with that as well. Okay. Thanks, Tom. So, uh, any other comment amongst the board? Okay. So, you know, based on uh, Doug's motion here, let's we can do a roll call. So, Johanna. Aye. And Andrew. Aye. Uh, Tom. Aye. And uh, Maria. Uh, yes. Are we approving to postpone the approval of the minutes? Is that what we're doing? Well. What are we doing? Are we okay. doing the um, we're, we're approving postponing. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. And then um, Janet. Yes. Yes. Okay. And have, okay. I apologize. Uh, have I forget? Have did I get everybody? Doug. Mr. Marshall. <laughs> yes. And then myself. Yes. Okay. I think we got us all. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Okay. Um, you have two yeah. people in the attendees who are related to the next topic. So I don't know if Pam wants to. Oh, okay. Is that like a public comment thing? I was going to say, are you going to do oh. public comment first? Excuse me. Public comment first. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't see any raised hands, but, um, I, I don't see any. Do you? No. Okay. All right. Okay. So the public comment period. Okay. So we're we're good with that. So and I'm gonna move Selena um, Weber, the panelist, and Martha Lyon, and Jane Wald. Okay. Okay, so we can ask um, Jane for the public comment period. You have like three minutes. So, um, Jack, do you want to read the um, what is it preamble that you would read to continue this public hearing? I think. Pam had sent it a couple of days ago. Uh, okay. Pam, do you have it up there? No, no, I don't. Um, the preamble for? Preamble for the Emily Dickinson Museum. Oh, I thought we were taking public comment. No, the people who just came in are people who are going to. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I can I can do that now. Okay. Uh, I was a little confused. Sorry. Um. I have it. Um. Somewhere. So many files. Um. Okay, I have it here. So, okay, so 647, uh, in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this public hearing continued from October 21st, 2020, has been duly advertised and noticed thereof, at, has been posted and uh, is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SBR 2021 
5-05, Emily Dickinson Museum-280 Main Street. Request site plan review approval to install a permeable uh, pedestrian pathway between the two historic homes, including lighting the pathway and to install the lighting to illuminate the facades of both homes and some tree removal. And this is on uh, lot map 14B, parcels, four, parcels 16 and 27 RG zoning district. So are there any board member uh, disclosures? I see none and the applicant may present at this time. So uh, we're we're asking for these um, things you just mentioned, and um, we had a discussion about it a couple weeks ago, and there were some things that were still, um, I guess, uh, you wanted to consider some more. And um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, we're here to answer any more questions that you might have about the, the pathway, the lighting, and the tree removal. Yes. So, um, I, I mean, I personally did not go by there. I mean, I, I, I thought that the uh, historical commission, there, there, there's a ticket of, uh, uh, of approval there. Um, but anyway, um, Johanna. Thanks, Jack. Um, so what I remember coming out of the last meeting was that a bunch of us were just curious to see what it looked like at night. And uh, today, right before dinner, my kids and I drove by and my reaction was just that it was so tasteful and so beautiful. Um, and because the buildings are on a hill and there's the fence there, it, it doesn't feel obtrusive at all. It's lovely. And even my 11 year old son said, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. So um, my, I don't know if this is jumping the gun, but I would like to go ahead kind of it, just in the spirit of time. And I feel like we spent a lot of time on this last week to go ahead and move to approve this, this proposal. Okay. I do see a hand by Doug and, and uh, Andrew. Um, Doug, in response to Johanna's, I don't, I don't know if you have additional comments or you want to. Yeah, I had, I had a question for the okay. applicant. Should I proceed or not? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I did go by and look at the, the lighting. Um, the lighting on the Dickinson house looked great. Um, one question about the security light that's on a pole behind the uh, the, the second house, I, whose name I'm blanking on, the Evergreens, I think it is. Um, would that security light stay on all the time as it does now? Because it's kind of kind of harsh and kind of all out by itself. I wondered whether it might go on after, you know, it would go on when the architectural lighting goes off. That's my question. All right, so the plan is to put in new security lighting at the backside of the evergreens. So the current security lighting wouldn't be operational anymore. And the new security lighting would be It's at the somehow, back. somehow less uh, jarring. Right, and it's at the back corners of the evergreens, the two um, corners. Um, pointing down at the, you know, towards the ground. Um, if okay. I can share my screen, do you want to see where they are? No, that's fine. It sounds like I'm, I'm fine with the fact that you're looking at that. Absolutely. Good question, Doug. Um, is there anyone who want to second uh, Johannes? Well, I, uh, I'll go ahead and second it. Okay. Uh, for the discussion, Chris? And Comment. Yep. Um, one of the things you were waiting for was to um, hear from the local historic district commission 
and they did meet and issued a certificate of appropriateness, which you have in your packets. And um, they were uh, recommending, or they they issued the certificate um, to approve what was being proposed. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think we've, we've gone through like a site visit report uh, because people have gone by. I don't know if there's any other comments from, from the board. Um, there were questions about um, whether the board could approve this to be on after um, business hours and also a question about whether the board could approve this um, to not be uh, completely downcast. And um, so I sent you some information today about um, the, the level of restrictions that planning boards can place on um, nonprofit educational institutions. And um, I, I quoted from chapter 40A, section three, which um, states what kinds of things can be restricted. And it's things like height and mass and um, setbacks and, and that type of thing. But it doesn't mention anything about lighting. So I wanted to um, ask Rob Mora, who is here, the building commissioner, if he would make some comments about um, the level of um, regulation that the planning board can put on um, on lighting and in specific with regard to um, section 11.2417 of the zoning bylaw. I thought he might be able to enlighten us about that if you would recognize him. Rob? Hi, uh, thank you. Um, Rob Moore, Building Commissioner. Uh, so to respond to uh, Ms. Brestrup's questions, I think there um, there's definitely um, a limit to the uh, amount of regulation that can apply to these types of uses. But uh, what that 40A uh, Section 3 language doesn't uh, talk about is, uh, you know, what cases have over the years told us is that uh, these uses are subject and can be subject to site plan review with reasonable regulation. So I think I think that does give you the opportunity to look at lighting and 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 and, and even change it or improve it uh, for a project. But when you look at lighting that might be unreasonably regulated, I would think of something like a uh, an athletic field where uh, reducing, limiting the height or eliminating lights would really render the use um, non non-existent. And that's what the Dover Amendment is intended to prevent. So I think if, if we're dealing with a use where uh, lighting is uh, more architectural or um, uh, parking related, uh, serving its purpose, but done in a way that is appropriately found by the board, I think it can be regulated. 11.2417 is pretty interesting because some of those guidelines, the, um, they're pretty specific uh, and they almost read more like rules. Uh, so they are they, they can be a challenge uh, for for projects. I know, um, you know, in the zoning board of appeals uh, world, we, we struggle with this oftentimes because the architectural lighting that is desirable and done tastefully and appropriately. Uh, sometimes doesn't really uh, work consistently with the language we have. So uh, there's a lot of language in that section. Some of it might be uh, a guideline or some criteria to judge the proposal on and something that might, might be more uh, firm of a uh, requirement. Thank you, Rob. Um, Chris Brestrup has her hand raised. Okay. I just Chris. wanted to make one point, which is that in the second sentence of 11.2417, um, there's an exception and it says, except for architectural, and then it says, and interior lit signs. And I think there's a word missing there. I think it should say, except for architectural lighting and interior lit signs, all exterior site lighting shall be downcast. 
um, because the last sentence says all site lighting, including architectural sign and parking lot lighting. So that indicates to me that there was a word missing from the second sentence. And after the word architectural, there should be the word lighting. So I just wanted to offer that for your consideration because that to me would um, give a little more flexibility with regard to architectural lighting in this particular situation. Uh, I see Janet's hand. So, um, so I did, I did a drive around Amherst around seven o'clock on Sunday. And I was just looking, you know, as one of the things I noticed when I moved to Amherst, it's extremely dark. And um, so I started in my part of the town, I went to the Munson library and there was a door light on a lamp, like at the entrance that so you could see the entrance. The South Congregational Church was dark except for two lights by the door. Um, everything I went by was just lighting um, doorways, you know. Um, the Johnson Chapel was an exception. They had a spire, their spire was lit up and there was like a, a light, you know, they, I guess these lights were going up and on their clock and flag. Um, the Baldwin Inn had lights at their doorways and the building and sign, but between that and the street lights, you can kind of see everything um, and also it being white. Um, so pretty much everything was not lit up after hours except for lights for entranceways or you know, think about safety or security. Um, Amherst Work Works did have a light onto its building. Um, you know, it was kind of like off the, from the ground pointing up, it's like a flood lamp, but it's also has, it's hours are, it's open 24 hours a day, it turns out, although I think right now it's not. And First Congregational Church had a spotlight from the ground up onto its front. And so everybody was dark. Um, Fine Arts Building had a hideous blue lights on some facade, and maybe it would be an art project. But I didn't do the whole look at um, the UMass, which obviously is open 24 seven. And so that was sort of my my um, field trip. And so you know, buildings aren't don't have architectural lighting as a rule, except for Johnson Chapel and those exceptions. And so that's one thing. I've been looking at the language for um, at this section of 11.2417. And when I first read it, when Tom called their attention to it, I was thinking, it sounds like to me, you have to turn your lights off when your business, is, your business hours are over. And for the Emily Dickinson Museum, you know, I don't think that necessarily is when the last guest leaves or visitor leaves, it could be when the staff leaves. And then today I was kind of reading it and I started to see it in a different way that maybe if there's an approved site management plan with business hours, we could follow that, which is what we have now that the lights go off at 10. And so I went into this, you know, windshield wiper of legal analysis, which made me feel like I wanted to know what did, what did the planning department, the planning board, select board and town meeting mean when they wrote this? Like is there any, you know, sometimes the planning board has commentary. Was that issue discussed? Were they trying to make sure you know, when you walk out the door at the end of the day, you turn your architectural lights off and everything but safety and security lights. So to me, that's like an open question. Um, and then Christine, um, I didn't really get a chance to look at that last thing about um, chapter 40A, but I, I think um, Mr. Morris interpretation makes sense to me because it seems like it might be too strict to say you couldn't do lighting. So, so I sort of leave that to the board. I feel like I, you know, and then the other thing is I looked at the Emily Dickinson Museum when it was lit up, it looks beautiful. Um, I love the Emily Dickinson Museum. I think I've been, been there like seven or eight times. Um, but I, I don't know if we have the power to, to say, yeah, you can leave the lights on until 10. And so I'm kind of left in that dilemma. And then I was trying to think of a way to approve this project, sub, you know, with some coming back later to see how late the lights can go on. We can do that look into the legislative history and figure out what a town meeting and the planning board and the select board mean when they said this or the planning department. I don't know when this rule gets written. So that's my, that's my physical journey. Um, I think it, the lighting looks fantastic, um, but I don't know if we can let you keep the lights on after the last person leaves other than safety lighting. Thank you, Janet. And uh, Doug. Yeah, I wanted to say that uh, 
the First Congregational Church, more or less across the street from the Evergreens, has uh, facade lighting that is on at least late, if not all night. Um, I believe that the police station also has uh, exterior lighting or, or else it's well illuminated by street lights. I can't remember. So there are a couple of instances right in this neighborhood where there are already uh, architectural lighting going on. Um, I guess I also was uh, wondering whether my colleague on the board who just spoke is an originalist uh, in, and uh, whether uh, we need to find out what the intent is of every single uh, article in the in our bylaws. <laughs> yeah. uh, good, good question. I mean, I, I mean, who who on the board has actually viewed the lighting? You know, in in uh, in the evening. Okay, so. Because I, I have not. Okay, so Maria, Johanna, Doug, and Tom, and obviously Janet. Okay. Um, Jack, again. Mr. McDougall has his hand raised as well. Okay, let me put that back on there. All right, Andrew, please. Oh, yeah, I, I, so I did see the lighting. I thought it looked beautiful as well. I, I do, I mean, I do think Janet's questions are valid. Like, do we, um, if if sort of Chris and Rob feel comfortable that that this is compliant, I think that's one thing I just would love to have that maybe be stated a little bit more definitively um, for the minutes. But um, yeah, I I mean I I had some similar concerns around um, maybe similar, but as I was contemplating this, uh, you know, do we do we are we setting any other precedents that might impact other buildings that we just have not considered at this point? Um, I'm not sure if that's the case or not, but yeah, I would I would love to have an answer to to Janet's question as well to to really feel comfortable because I I would love to be able to approve this. Um, Chris, Rob, not sure if if you might feel comfortable. Jack, thank you, Andrew. Um, I guess we could you know pull in with that, uh, Chris. Well, I did want to go back to my point about um, potentially a missing word in 11.2417. Um, it says protection of adjacent properties by minimizing the intrusion of lighting, including parking lot and building exterior lighting through the use of cutoff luminaires, light shields, lowered height of light pole, screening or similar solutions. And then it says, except for architectural, what does that mean? And interior lit signs, are they talking about architectural signs? That doesn't make sense to me. It makes more sense if you say, except for architectural lighting and interior lit signs, all exterior lighting shall be downcast and shall be directed or shielded to eliminate light trespass. On And then it goes on. So I, I just think there is a word missing there um, and that architectural lighting may be um, an exception from this. In other words, if you have a pole light, it's got to shine down. But if you have a light on the building, that's an architectural light, does that have to shine down too? So anyway, I'm just offering that for your um, consideration. And I wonder if the, what the building commissioner thinks about that interpretation, whether he thinks there might be a word missing or, um, or not. And if mm -hmm. that makes any difference, because I know that you know, many people believe you have to read the black letter of the law and even if there is a word missing, you have to go along with whatever the words say. So, so I'd like to pull uh, you know, Rob in to see if he has comment on that. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I, I do agree with Christine on that. Um, there definitely, in my opinion, is a word missing there. And, uh, you know, we have to oftentimes try to interpret what's there and apply it. Uh, in the way that that makes the most sense. So I, I would agree with that, but it does sound like to me, the question here is about the time when the lights are extinguished, um, not so much whether or not the lights can be there and be used. Uh, and, I, and I think that's really up to the board to, to make that call. I think it, 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 it's not wrong to 
uh, have the lights on uh, for you know extended periods of time. Uh, on the other side, it's it's, it's certainly okay to regulate their timing. So it really does you know depend on the board's view of uh, the business hours that are established. You know, extinguishing outside of those business hours established under the plan. Uh, and how much uh, flexibility uh, the board wants to have with uh, the timing of those uh, those lights. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Janet? As, as to Christine's point, it might just be a typo. So if you went back to when this was on the town meeting warrant, it might be that word um, architectural lighting, that phrase might be there. So this could just be a typo of transcription. Um, I guess my question is, is, do we have the discretion to extend business hours beyond, you know, when people are really using the building? And so when I was doing my drive around Amherst, I had like never had thought about this issue before. And since almost every old, beautiful, iconic building I saw was dark, except for lighting of you know doorways which you would do for safety um i wondered is this a rule you know like you know when you're when people aren't there you turn it off some some you know buildings had interior lights on although nobody seemed to be in there and so i don't know if we had the disc what this last sentence means and so as a, you know I, I don't know if i'm an originalist but with a question like this i would go back and say what's the legislative history what what was meant at the time what was the, the legislative body or the planning department that it's like, where was this issue discussed? And if people were like, oh, you know, ask the question, then the answer was given, or it's in something, and you just say, okay, this rule is very narrow. You can't have lights on after business hours. Or it could be like, no, if the business, if the, um, the site management plan has a limit, that could be the limit. So I, it does seem technical, but I think that on one hand, you look like if it is a rule, it looks like most of the town is complying and maybe not first congregational church, although they may see that as a safety light. But I just, I don't have the answer to that. Like I just kind of went back and forth between interpretations and I thought, you know, Lord knows that when we decide things in this town about zoning, there's a lot of, you know, information and writings on it and be good to look at. And then maybe we can go back and look at what was on the warrant because, you know, that missing word architectural lighting and interior, like that signs might be in there and it's just a typo in how this was described. Um, I, you know, I'm kind of, I want to approve this project too. I just want to know to do it the right way following the bylaw. And then the other thing about what Andrew said is we may be changing the rule and we might be just starting to light up all our buildings in Amherst, which may be lovely or not. You know, I just, I just want to know what people meant at the time when they approved this. It's very detailed. Thanks, Janet. So um, somebody must have. Yeah. Well, sorry. It's a very detailed, very specific rule. So it seems like there's a lot of thought put into it. It's just this last little sentence that is confusing to me. And I just don't, I come out on one side or the other. And so then it goes, I go to the intent. It's not originalist. It's kind of the normal way you would interpret any kind of rule or law is to look at the legislative intent if you need it. Thank you. Uh, Maria. Uh, let's see if I can remember. Uh, I, I think that this project is not going to set a precedent for other projects, um, whether or not we follow the letter of the law. I think the intent is that this is like a, like that um, bylaw that Chris Brestrup sent um, a few weeks ago, like Somerville, they make exceptions or a different sort of um, uh, <clears throat> situation for like monuments, landmarks. And I think that's what this is. It's basically it's not like a business hours issue. It's literally they're lighting up a landmark um, for the town. So I'm not as concerned about, you know, meeting the letter of law um, regarding business hours. I think this is a special case. Um, and I think we're treating it that way because we're allowing, um, you know, like the actual fixtures are not down, uh, dark sky compliant, but that the design is. And so I, I'm not worried about this project being pointed to by other um, projects saying, you know, well, you did this for the museum. So um, I feel like, you know, if, if uh, 
Mr. Mora and Ms. Breshrup are, you know, have been saying it's open to interpretation. Well, my interpretation is I'm fine with it. I'm fine with them leaving it on for um, the appropriate amount of time, like a beyond what other buildings in the area do. And um, I think that I, when I drove by, it was a lot less glaring than the photos because um, um, when you take a photo, it kind of catches the hot spots. So it was very nicely designed. And um, I um, I know there's a motion on the table and that it's been seconded. So I'm eager to move on that um, if we can, but um, that's my perspective. Thank you, Maria and uh, Doug. Yeah, two things. First of all, I just received a call from somebody who's trying to get into this meeting as an attendee and they are saying that the Zoom link is not letting them in. So I thought I'd let Pam know that that's at least what apparently five or six people are not being able to get into the meeting. Um, although I see that there's a bunch of attendees, so it's working for some people. Mm -hmm. um, then um, at least the way I see the, uh, the bylaw, uh, you know, it looks to me like we could establish the business hours uh, during which the lighting can be illuminated through approving the site management plan. So I, I can't remember whether we've received a site management plan to review, but uh, you know, it seems to me whatever hours are approved in that plan is consistent with the letter of the law. We did get a Thank management you. plan, I believe, Chris, and I believe I have it. It would be in the packet from the 21st of October. Uh, Tom? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up and say that I, I agree with, um, I agree with Maria um, as well as Doug and, and I was the one who raised this and it was more of a question. And, and I think that, um, it's good for us to dig into these kinds of questions to try to better understand what it is that we are and are not legislating and what it is that um, um, <clears throat> the intent was behind this. Um, I think that regardless of what the um, official intent was, I do agree with Maria that this is not a case that other, that a, a Home Depot could use as a precedent. Um, or even a bakery for that matter. Um, I think that this is a landmark and this has a unique position in our community and therefore it is um, um, that our interpretation is, is open in that way. Um, and I do agree with, um, with Doug that the management plan also allows us to better understand that, to approve that and allow us to move forward with approving this project um, in haste. Great. So um, there's not any other questions from the board. We can open this. Oh, Janet. So just just an idea is would people object to finding out more information about why this would why this language is this way? It would just take us two more weeks. And so that would that's thought. So I do don't I don't want to like, you know, if we make decisions that are not what the language says, we're sort of becoming legislators. Um, you know, I, I appreciate that the Emily Dickinson is iconic, um, but it's there's no exception for iconic buildings in this town, and there's lots of historic buildings. In fact, I, I was thrilled at how many beautiful buildings we had, and so I think we could be opening the door to a lot of requests to light up Amherst, which could be fantastic, but if the town meeting didn't want that to happen, and we have all this language about dark sky and keeping things low, you know, let's follow the intent and the language. But I do see the interpretation in the other direction. That's why I would like to go back and find out, was this discussed? So if people, you know, could we take two weeks to look at that and find out what they're saying and then see if this this is a typo of leaving out the word lighting in front of architect. I mean, just, I don't know. So that I ask people to consider that. Um, Rob. Uh, I just want to <clears throat> offer a little, little something here because it does sound to me like it's 
the hesitation is only about the language and the bylaw, not about the project or the design itself. And, you know, what Christine uh, Brescia brought up earlier with the, the 40A Section 3 language, it is really appropriate for the board to determine that uh, this section, pieces of it uh, are reasonable to regulate and others may not be. So you've, you've uh, uh, received cut sheets on shielded uh, proper lumens, uh, angle of positioning and determined that, you know, regulating it to that degree is reasonable, but extinguishing at a certain time when the, the staff leaves or even applying a standard that raises question on, you know, where it comes from is unreasonable to apply in this case. And you can simply move on from that point and, and just uh, establish that under a, a, a nonprofit educational institution application. Um, Jane? Yes, thank you. There's only one comment I'd like to make and that's about uh, the, the issue of precedence. Um, the, Emily Dickinson Homestead is literally a national historic landmark. And there are maybe, I, it, it's almost unique in Amherst uh, for having that status in case that helps with the question of precedence. Thank you. I, may I make a comment? Yes, you may, Chris. I wanted to comment on the um, the ability of staff to research what the intent was. And I, the reason I'm saying that is because um, section 11.24 is largely based on um, the special permit criteria, which are section 10.38 and the wording of one of the criteria in 10.38, which is actually 10.393 is essentially the same as um, 11.2417. So my understanding of this is when site plan review was um, adopted, and I think it was adopted in 1988 or 87, something like that, um, the um, town looked back to the criteria that the ZBA used to um, accept or deny special permits, and they pretty much adopted the same language. So we would have to go back to the time when um, the special permit was adopted by the town. And I don't even know how far that would be that we'd have to go back. So I, I don't know if there would be planning board reports from that time. Rob may know more about when special permits were first adopted um, by the state. And it could go back into, I'm sure it goes back to at least the 40s because we have special permits here from the 40s and, and into those records is going to be challenging. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Doug. Yeah, since uh, Chris cited 10.393, it, it does read exactly the same. Uh, if there were a missing word, it's in both sections, uh, which starts to make me think there's not a missing word and that architectural is modifying the word signs, not lighting. Gotcha. So thank you. I mean, amongst the, uh, the architects, you know, on the board, I appreciate that. I'm a little confused with regard to the extent that we're deliberating this, but <clears throat> um, I'm trying to like, you know, get this to a vote. Um, and Janet? So now that we're in a, another area, um, I, is there, for the architects, is there a difference between an architectural sign and an interior lit sign? Is an like interior lit, lit sign like a neon sign versus just like a, what's an architectural sign? Is that something? Is that like a wood sign or? Uh, 
I, I believe this reference is an uh, architectural lit or interior lit sign. And so it, it, architectural should have a hyphen after it, um, meaning that the lighting is shining up on like an architectural lighting onto the sign or that it is internally illuminated with light bulbs inside of a translucent material from the inside out. So architect, I don't know why we're dealing with this now, but if it had a hyphen, that would make more sense. So we can rewrite that sometime in the future. That's, that's my. <laughs> so um, I'm confused, um, not being an architect and, and this whole lighting thing. So um, I would hope one of the board members would make a motion to, uh, you know, amend or approve the project as proposed and Maria I thought uh Johanna and Doug already motion made the motions and seconded are we ready to vote Is okay it just discussions over and we can vote okay I'm uh if I I kind of lost track if that is yeah. the case <laughs> Is that right, Chris? Favor, Chris. Yes, that is right. Okay, so we're, so all right, so um, we are ready to vote. But but uh, Janet had one more comment. Um, do we do we have public comment on this, or do we have a moment for that? I'm just wondering. Is that isn't that we norm? Do we normally do that, or do we have to do that, or we can skip it? Uh, no, we, we do have public comments from uh, in the question period, so. So Jack, before you do that, can I just say, um, sort of in response to Doug receiving a telephone call that people could not get on. I've been in contact with the IT folks. They've checked the links. They're all the same. Um, and they are having no problem getting on. So the IT people are suggesting that people try again um, if they if they could not get on. So just to say that if, if you're going to do public comment. Okay. Um, I don't see any hands raised at this time, Jack. Okay. Oh, okay. So uh, now one has popped up as soon as I said that. <laughs> Alrighty. Who's that? Um, um, Elizabeth Veerling, and okay. I can allow her to speak. Okay. Hi, Elizabeth. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I just wanted to comment that the problem with getting onto the into the meeting was not that the link was not working. The problem was that the link was not available. Um, I could not find it on the town website. And we had received an email from Chris, who's been wonderful in keeping us apprised in the neighborhood, uh, but that link was not functional. So that was the problem, is that if you go on the town website, you could not find a link for this meeting. Thank you. Interesting. Um, Doug has his hand raised. Well, I, I don't do you want to respond to that that Chris, I mean, or, or Pam, I mean, um, I'm, it's in the meeting posting that I know and also um, the link the zoom link to the meeting is also on the agenda. So that's also posted in a few different ways. So yeah. Um, what IT suggested was was that maybe that they were trying before we went live, but I don't think that that's the case because the link would still be there. Because when I go back after a posting has been submitted and I see that it's posted and I go to check to make sure everything is is there and correct, it's it's there and visible. Right. Um, so I'm not as I'm not exactly sure, but I'm really happy that um, Ms. Beerling pointed it out, um, and so we can we we're still looking into it here. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Doug? And we have another hand in the public comment. Yeah, the, uh, right. am, am I correct that the thing we've been talking about for the last half hour is whether we are legislatively allowed to approve a design where some of the lights are not downcast? You know, Good because question. is that what we're talking about? That, you know, all exterior lighting shall be downcast and shall be directed or shielded to eliminate light trespass onto any street or abutting property. Well, I think all the lighting that we're talking about is directed away from abutting properties and away from streets. It is not all downcast. So, I, I guess, you know, it seems like most of us think this is a decent proposal and I don't know whether we're better off just approving it and having somebody object later, but um, maybe Janet, maybe you could, ex you could confirm that's what the problem is. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Also, Jack, I want to let you know there, there is another hand in the, um, Public in the comment. public comment, yeah. yes. Mora. Okay. Mora, do you want to say um, yep. who okay. you are, uh, where you live, sort of thing? Sure. Um, I'm Mora Keen, and I live on Dennis Drive in Amherst, but I was responding to Elizabeth's comment that the way to get on is to go to the planning board page of the town website and then the agenda is posted there and the link is on the agenda. If you go to the main town website page, it's hard to get on. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, I see no more um, hands from the public. Um, and the applicant, you know, I don't know if you have any other responses. No? Okay. Um, so final comments and questions from the board for conditions findings. Can we discuss? You did receive conditions um, in your packet. I don't know if you want to look at those or, or look at the findings. Um, yeah, I'm bringing those up myself. We also have them on the screen. I can share my screen. Mm -hmm. So that, those are in our packet, right? They're here too, Jack, on the screen. Can you okay. see them? Do you want me to read them, Jack, or do you want to read them? If you would, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so these are draft findings for the Emily Dickinson Museum Site Plan Review 2021-05. Um, so the board found, uh, this, these are findings that the board needs to make. Um, 11.2400. The project is in conformance with all appropriate provisions of the zoning bylaw and goals of, of the master plan. Um, so just to let the new members know, what usually happens is we go through these and read them. And then if someone has an objection or a comment about one of the findings, um, they raise their hand and ask to be recognized. Um, and I'm gonna be reading this, so I won't know if anybody's raising their hand. Um, 11.2401, town amenities and abutting properties will be protected through minimizing detrimental or offensive actions. All of the changes will occur on site with the exception of a tie-in to the town drainage system via a catch basin on Main Street, which the town engineer has reviewed 
and about which he has not expressed concerns. Um, 11.2402. Chris, I want to let you know that Janet McGowan has her hand raised. I'm not sure when it popped up. Okay. Does Jack want to recognize Janet? Yes, Janet. So, you know, the, the first criteria, the project is in conformance with all appropriate provisions of the zoning bylaw. And I think I, I, I feel like I can't say yes um, because of the issue that Tom had raised about whether lighting can go on past business hours. And now the issue that Doug has raised, whether downcast lighting, I mean, all lighting should be downcast except for those limited exceptions. And so I don't feel like I know what this by this section of the bylaw actually says. Part, I can't really say, yeah, we're meeting the sections of the bylaw when we have two discussions going not clear on what this bylaw requires. So I, ha I can't say yes to no. And then we're going to start talking about the lighting saying lights will be downcast and shielded or directed, you know? And so I think um, I, I, I kind of just need to know more about what this provision means. And so, you know, you, you're putting me in a, a hard spot because I do like the lighting plan. I do like the way it looks. I like the Emily Dickinson Museum. I particularly love the evergreens, but I don't think we can say yes, that we're meeting all the provisions of the bylaw because the issue's raised. Thanks, Janet. Um, Do you want me to keep reading? Chris, yes. Okay, 11.2402. Oh, I think I just read, oh wait, no. Abutting properties will be protected from detrimental site characteristics resulting from the proposed use. Lights will be downcast and or shielded and or directed so as not to spill onto adjacent properties or streets. So that's really the issue having to do with it, it, the lighting's effect on adjacent properties and streets, not on exact reading of um, 11.2417. Okay, um, section 11.2403, adequate recreational facilities and open space are available because the property is large and open and will include substantial lawn areas. 11.2410, unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features will be protected. The local historic district commission will be, has, has reviewed that has to say has has reviewed the proposal and um, has issued a certificate of appropriateness. I wrote these um, suggested findings back before the local historic district had made its uh, determination. 11.2411, the project provides adequate methods of refuge disposal as described in the management plan. 11.2412, the project is connected to town sewer and water. No changes are proposed to the sewer and water connections. 11.2413, uh, the proposed drainage system within and adjacent to the site will be adequate to handle the stormwater. Under Mr. Jemsek and Ms. Brastrup, Mr. Marshall has his hand raised. Okay. Yeah, I, I, um, thought, that, I thought there was a new connection to the town sewer. Well, there is a connection to the town drain, it, drain uh, system, but not to the sanitary system. And this 11.2412 um, relates to the sanitary system. There is another um, item here that relates to the drainage system. Okay, thank you. So 11.2413, the proposed drainage system within and adjacent to the site will be adequate to handle the stormwater. Under drains are being added under the proposed pathway and in the lawn area to the south of the proposed pathway. The town engineer has reviewed the proposal and has not expressed any concerns. We did get a subsequent email from him, which I think I forwarded to planning board members saying that he was fine with the proposal to connect to the drain system in the street. 11.2414, provision of adequate landscaping has been addressed. The project includes significant existing vegetation that will be maintained and some existing vegetation that will be removed to return the site to the conditions closely resembling those at the time that Emily Dickinson lived in the homestead. 11.2415, the soil erosion method control methods are considered adequate to control soil erosion both during and after construction. 11.2416, adjacent properties will be protected by minimizing the intrusion of various nuisances. And here's the bugaboo, 11.2417, Adjacent properties will be protected from the intrusion of lighting because a condition of the permit 
will require that exterior lighting be downcast and or shielded and or directed so as not to shine onto adjacent properties or streets. New lighting will be directed towards pathways and structures on the site, except for the lights that will shine upward to illuminate the facade, all exterior lighting will be downcast and directed or shielded to eliminate light trespass onto any street or abutting property and will eliminate direct or reflected glare perceptible to persons on any street or abutting property. Other than security lighting, site lighting will be operated by timers and will only be on from dusk until 10 p.m. Mr. Jemsek and Fred. I see Doug's hand, yes. Yeah, once again, uh, I'm not sure that's quite exactly true because there's those lights at the two pedestrian entrances through the fence. Um, those shine mostly up, but on the, on the, on the fence post. So except for lights that will shine upward to illuminate the facade or fence posts, I would add those words. Good comment. I'm Thanks, ready. Doug. Uh, Tom has a comment as well. Just a way to frame that, it could just be architectural elements that include the building and the fence post and other things. Um, so maybe not so specific as fence posts. Chris, can Does you Marshall agree with that um, interpretation? No objection. Okay. All right. Um, 11.2418 um, is not applicable because the property is not located in the flood prone conservancy district. 11.2419 is not applicable because there are no wetlands on or within 100 feet of the property. 11.2420, uh, the planning board did not choose to refer to the design principles and standards set forth in sections 3.3040 and 3.2041 of the zoning bylaw because the local historic district commission will undertake a review of the proposal or did undertake a review of the proposal and um, considered issues of design and, and issued a certificate of appropriateness. Okay. 11.2421 um, is not applicable because there are no changes proposed to the setbacks, placement of parking, landscaping, and entrances and exits. Chris, so, I, if it's it's not applicable, I, I think we're good with that. You don't you don't need to read. No need to say what? Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> 11.2422 not applicable. 11.2433, not applicable. 11.2424, screening has been provided as appropriate for storage areas, loading docks, dumpsters, rooftop equipment, utility buildings, and similar features. No changes are being proposed regarding screening. 11.2430, the site has been designed to provide for the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement within the site and in relation to adjoining ways and properties. No changes are being proposed. 11.2431 is not applicable. 11.2432, the location and design of parking spaces, bicycle racks, drive aisles, loading areas, and sidewalks have been provided in a safe and convenient manner. Parking on the site is limited and no changes are being proposed to the parking area. 11.2433 is not applicable. 11.2434 is not applicable. 11.2435 is not applicable. 11.2436, the requirement for submittal of a traffic impact statement. I'm assuming this is true, but when you get to the waivers, you'll um, you'll be able to tell me, um, will be waived. There's very, very little traffic expected to enter and leave the site given the limited amount of parking on the site. And 11.2437 is not applicable if you waive the traffic impact statement. Um, the waivers are listed in the development application report, so you might want to look at that if Pam can bring it up. Mm -hmm. That was in um, 
I don't know if you have it in this packet, Pam. I do. Just tell me again where it was. Development it's application it's report right here. But it should be like on the second page or something like that. Um, so go okay. back to pages. So the waivers are listed here on the second page. They've asked for a waiver of the sign plan and the traffic impact statement. So um, do you want me to read the um, proposed conditions, Jack? Um, I'm just to trying to find them myself on the, on the packet here. Wait, wait one minute. Um, Pam has them up on the screen. Okay. Oh, okay. I blew right by them. <laughs> um, so please, thank you, Russ. All right. So um, th these are draft conditions. Development shall be built substantially in accordance with the plan submitted to the planning board and approved on whatever date you approve this. Development shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on whatever date you approve it. All exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant to the extent feasible. Exterior lighting shall be downcast, shielded and directed and shall not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. Shielded directional flood lighting that is aimed so that direct glare is not visible from adjacent properties be permitted for the purpose of lighting building facades, the purposes of other vertical structures such as fence post elevations and entryways. I think I took some of that wording from the um, from the Somerville regulations. Um, changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plans or to the exterior of the building should be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change and or to determine whether the changes are demanding or significant enough to require modification of the site plan approval. And then one hard copy and one digital copy of final revised plans shall be submitted to the planning board. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so with that, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking for uh... So, um, is there a motion to close this public hearing and, and um, approve with any amendments? You have a motion on the floor, Jack, from um, Johanna, and it was seconded by Mr. Marshall. Okay. Motion okay. Did, Johanna's motion didn't include closing the public hearing or um, approval of the conditions, the waivers, and the Fine. findings. So you, last time around, you decided as a board that you would take these things separately, that you would close the public hearing with one vote, and then you would um, move on to approval with approval of conditions, waivers, and findings as a second vote. Johanna has her hand raised as well. Okay, Johanna. Thank you. I'm sorry if I jumped the gun in terms of process. I don't quite I don't quite know whether the right thing right now would be for me to withdraw my motion and whether that needs approval, but it seems like that makes the most sense and then take them sequentially. Mm -hmm. So I withdraw my vote my motion. Yeah, I don't think that needs a vote. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so again, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on this. Um, and I'm just looking, you know, I'm trying to reset here. We've been to this for like 45 minutes uh, or more. Um, so would there be a motion, a motion for, you know, the applicant that meets the relevant criteria of section 11.24 of, of the zoning bylaw and. Excuse me, Jack. I think what you want right now is a, 
a motion to close the public hearing. Okay. Need that motion. All right, Janet. I move to close the public hearing. Okay, thank you. And Andrew? I second that motion. Thank you. Okay. Um, do we need more discussion at this point? Mr. Mark, well, um, I think what you need is a motion to approve the project to, um, and then to in include the conditions and findings and waivers in the approval. Okay, so as, as presented. <clears throat> well, Chris, we didn't do a roll call vote on the motion that's on the floor to close the public hearing. So we should do that first, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jack, you wanna do a roll call vote on- Absolutely, okay, okay. Uh, Janet? Um, yes. All right, and Johanna? Aye. And um, Andrew? I'm gonna think about, no, yes, I- <laughs> <laughs> Wise guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Doug? Aye. And Tom? And we got Maria. Yes. Did we get everybody? Johanna? Jack. Yes, it's Am only you, Jack. I'm good. I'm good. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay, I'm flipping. I'm flipping between the participants' little frame and then our frame of our, um, uh, you know, Brady bunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so all right, so we're good with that. Um, now you need a motion to approve and to approve the conditions and findings and waivers. Okay, so Mr. McDougall, a motion, I Andrew. I would like to make that motion, please. As great, a second. Doug? Second. All right, great, thank you. And um, no further discussion, right? Don't see any hands. Okay. So, so the motion is that the, the applicant meets the uh, relevant criteria of uh, section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw with the conditions and waivers mm -hmm. as discussed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So roll call. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going by the pictures this time. So I'm clear. Um, Andrew. Proof. Doug. Hi. Tom. Hi. Janet. I'm going to abstain. And Maria. Approve. Johanna. Approve. And I approve. So that's uh, 601. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Martha and Jane. And Selena. And, um, and oh, where, where I uh, like, there you go, Selena, sorry. <laughs> Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. So we have an eight o'clock, uh, you know, joint, uh, hearing with the CRC, um, and can we? I, I maybe we can take care of the Applebrook. Yes. Quickly. Okay. So we go to old business, and um, Chris, if you if you want to present this, I mean, it seems like we've got the appropriate recommendations from the town engineer.
mm -hmm. uh, from the from the site development uh, representative there that this could be a go. So, so um, this uh, project has been on the planning board's plate for a long time since 2007. Um, it's um, been under construction now for a while. Um, the roadway has recently been completed to the uh, extent that the town engineer feels that um, it has been completed with the exception of some minor work related to loaming and seeding for the amount of about $4,000. Um, so the town engineer doesn't have any reason to recommend that you don't release lot seven. So the request is to release lot seven and not to take any other lots under um, the covenant. And therefore all of the lots in the subdivision will be released and um, lot seven can be sold to be developed. So that's the request. And we do have a certificate of performance that Pam Mm -hmm. As available for you to look at, you're going to be asked to sign this if you um, agree to release lot seven. Pam, mm -hmm. can you put that uh, certificate of yep. performance up? Um, I'm working on it. I think I sent it to you late this afternoon. Here it is. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And Mr. McDougal has his hand raised. Oh. Um, whoops. Sorry. So, Andrew, yes. Oh, yeah. So, it was just real quick. The, on the map, um, lot one was highlighted. Is that, was that just like a, the way the map had to get pulled up, or does oh, lot mean anything here? The locust map, um, when we, um, get that from the GIS, it's hard to um, select numerous items without one of them kind of standing out. So the one that stands out, I think, on that map is the uh, one that was the original house that was on the um, property. Yeah. That, okay. That's what I figured. I just wanted to clarify. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. So the actual lot that is asked to be released is shown on the ANR plan, which Pam can um, bring up. This plan here, yeah. and lot seven is this pork chop shaped lot. So that's the one that they want to be released. And we and we got uh, an email from Jason Skeel saying that it was um, the road was substantially uh, completed. Correct. Uh, yes. Okay. Miss, oh, Mr. Marshall, put his hand down. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure there was documented evidence that it was finished. Except for that $4,000 worth of loam and seed, it is finished. Okay. Just wanted to make sure we didn't need to make a site visit to see it ourselves before we certify. I don't think so. I think we can take the word of the town engineer. Yeah. Great. So uh, uh, I see um, Andrew. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I just went. So can do we just need a motion then? I mean, to close this whole business out, a motion to release a lot. Yes. I believe so. Yeah. We don't need to close any public hearing because we don't have a public hearing open. It's just part of the public meeting. So you just need a motion to um, release lot seven. Okay. I'll, I'll make that motion. <laughs> I'll second. Great. Thank you. That, uh, any, di any discussion? Is that Janet or Johanna? That, that was Janet. 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 Okay. Yeah. Any discussion? We can go slow and we can go fast. So we have both and yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Andrew, I'm going to start with you. Uh, roll call. Approve. All right. Thank you. Doug. Approve. Great. Tom. Approve. And Maria. Approve. Johanna. Approve. Uh, did I get Janet? No. 
I'm sorry. You, oh, there you're at the very top. Oh my gosh. All right. Janet. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you. All right. And Jack. And Jack. Oh, and me. Yes, approve. So. All right. So I'll be asking you to come in and sign this. I'll try to combine it with something else that you can sign. So you don't have to make um, is it just for that. In fact, I might offer to drive to your homes and hopefully it won't be on a rainy day. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, you, you do, you go beyond, you know, duty with regard to coming <laughs> to our houses and that. So I really appreciate that. I know other board members uh, think the same. So we're right, you know, right at eight o'clock. Uh, I know we were, we we're going to talk about the, uh, the, the uh, 40R for, for uh, downtown, but that, you know, that's very conceptual. Um, I can give a report for two minutes until we get to eight o'clock. If you'd like me to do that under new business mass sure. implementation. So, okay. Yeah. So Doug Marshall and I have been working on um, filling in the master plan implementation matrix. And so far, we've spent, um, let's see, one and a half to three, about five hours on um, working on it over the course of three days. And we've gotten pretty far, but we haven't quite gotten far enough to present the matrix to the planning board yet. Um, so I just wanted to um, make that report and hopefully we will be able to uh, present the matrix to you um, soon. Great, thank you. And thank thank you, Doug, for, mm -hmm. for taking that on. Um, mm -hmm. And so at this point, you that wanna have- That was 59 by my computer, but we could start asking the CRC people to come in Yes. Um, because they should be here in attendees. I saw a few. Um, I see Ms. Haneke. I see Swartz. Uh, I see Mr. Ross. Okay. Shalane, I do not see or Mr. Schreiber, unless they're here by a different name. You might wanna ask um, Ms. Haneke to list the names of the mm -hmm. people that she expects to attend. Well, we have, we have Evan here, Mandy and Sarah has been promoted over to a panelist. So I don't see Chalonet or Steve Schreiber. Yep. Um, I believe they are attending. Let me make sure I don't have any emails from them. So I'm not getting any messages that they're having problems coming in. Um, okay. We have a quorum to be able to start CRC. Um, Shalini has just arrived. Oh, yep, there's Shalini, okay. Let's get her in first and then I will. Hello. There she is. Hi, Shalini. Um, I will, Hello. I will call us to order since she's in, we'll keep watch on the attendees to make sure Steve, so that we can get him in when he does join. Um, but since we have a quorum, I will go through my call to order stuff. So um, seeing a quorum of the community resources committee, I am calling this special meeting of the community resources committee committee to order that is joint with the planning board at 8.02 p.m. on November 4th, 
Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGL chapter 30A section 20 allows us to hold this virtual meeting, special meeting of the Community Resources Committee. Um, I believe the meeting is being recorded for future broadcast and any votes we take will be by roll call. At this time, I'm going to make sure all the committee members can hear us and we can hear you. Mm -hmm. um, so I will take roll essentially at this time. Um, Shalini. Here. Uh, Evan. Here. Sarah. Here. And Mandy is here. Um, Steve is still not here, I believe, right? No. So Steve is missing. We will keep track to see. Um, and then at this time, I am going to pass the virtual gavel of the CRC meeting to the chair of the planning board, Jack Jemsek, who will open the hearing on behalf of the CRC when he opens it on behalf of the planning board too. Um, I think that's all I have to do at this time. Okay, so um, what we have um, the zoning bylaw, Article 14 amended. You have a preamble that Pam oh, sent. Okay, I, I thought she already stated that, but. Um, um, so you should probably. In accordance with MGL chapter 40A, is this uh, the correct? Because I, I do have. Diff, you know, a couple of different copies here. Um, it's the one having to do with Article 14. Um, it's a special one that Pam prepared. So okay, let me get to that one. Uh, she says, sorry, I apologize. Um, it would have been all the same email, Jack. Got it. Yes. I just, I, I have, you know, multiple emails here from. We bombard you with emails. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pam, can you bring it up on the screen? I actually don't, Chris. Lesson learned. I think I have it. If you want me to bring it up. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, I keep getting the, the, the one that Mandy had sent me and that's not the same. Is it not the same? It's not exactly the same. Okay, here I got it. All right. All right. So um, in accordance with the provisions of uh, sections five and 11 of chapter 40A, this joint public hearing of the Amherst Planning Board and the Community Resources Committee of the Amherst Town Council been uh, duly advertised and noticed thereof has been posted and mailed to Mass uh, Department of Housing and Communication Development and the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and abutting towns. This hearing is being held for the purpose of providing an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding the proposed amendment to the Amherst Zoning Bylaw. This amendment will be on the agenda for Town Council at an upcoming meeting, zoning bylaw article 14 amended, uh, temporary zoning uh, regarding permitting for certain uses during the COVID-19 emergency and its aftermath. Uh, so this article is to see if the town will vote to amend article 14 of the zoning bylaw, temporary zoning regarding permitting for certain uses during the COVID-19 emergency and its aftermath by extending the expiration date until December 31st, 2021 and expanding its scope to apply to medical uses and the OP and PRP zoning districts and to apply to the placement of temporary structures in any zoning district for the following uses. Class one and class two farm stand nonprofit educational institution, not-for-profit library or museum, medical or residential institutions, 
governmental administration, building, fire or police station, and other government use not specifically listed herein to help businesses to more quickly emerge from the economic disaster created by the COVID-19 pandemic. So any board member disclosures? And do we see, I see none. Um, Chris and Rob are to provide a presentation. I think um, Mr. Moore is gonna provide the presentation and I'm here to answer questions. Okay. Thank you, Rob Moore, Building Commissioner. Uh, you is a proposed amendment uh, to Article 14. Article 14 was adopted this past summer uh, to uh, allow administrative approval for certain uh, types of use. Uh, that was due to expire uh, mid-December. So uh, what we have here is a, a proposal to not only extend it uh, through December 31st, 2021, but to expand it uh, a little bit to include some additional uses that we think, uh, you know, we'd like to be prepared for uh, the possibility of uh, needing uh, either additions or alterations to these types of uses. Uh, in, in the affected uses section of the proposed article, uh, we are adding uh, office park and PRP zoning districts uh, specifically for the option to allow medical office uses to be able to expand if needed, uh, alter the site or um, you know anything that might be needed to help accommodate whatever uh, those uses might be dealing with during the pandemic. Uh, beyond that, we uh, are proposing temporary uses and a definition to go along with that. What we saw during this so far is uh, a, a need for things, uh, permanent or temporary structures like uh, uh, tents uh, and storage buildings. Uh, and, and we are talking, we have talked a lot about things like um, portable bathrooms and other facilities. Uh, that possibly could be needed. So we thought we'd uh, include a temporary use provision that uh, allows for uh, things to happen here with the intent that uh, when this is all over, uh, that the, uh, the use or the site returns to its original condition, uh, which is how we define that. Uh, we included uh, a variety of uses here, class one, class two farm stands. Our thought there is that maybe in the spring, uh, there'll be increased interest in opening or expanding farm stands. Uh, again, this is all to uh, allow things to happen quicker, but not really uh, bypassing any of the bylaw requirements. Uh, the nonprofit educational institutions, uh, churches, uh, libraries, uh, uh, and governmental uh, associated uh, uses are included in the list for possible temporary uh, needs. Uh, the rest of the uh, bylaw will remain the same uh, as proposed, and uh, so far, uh, just a little bit of background. So far, uh, used a few times, uh, uh, one permanent uh, uh, addition or alteration, and a couple that were temporary for uh, outside use uh, for a personal care establishment. Uh, there's quite a bit of talking and planning going on for possible uh, use of this bylaw and certainly an extension uh, to the end of next year would, would give confidence to uh, a business owner to move ahead with a proposal. Thank you, Rob. Um, so are there any questions from planning board or the CRC on this? I see uh, and Andrew. Thanks, Jack, and thanks for the presentation, Rob. I, I have a question related to the um, the memo from Paul. Oh, I'm sorry, from, from you and Chris to Paul. Um, that talks, I just wanted to make sure I understood this correctly, that talks about um, 
a structure going into the public way. Um, I, I can just read this paragraph if that makes sense. Um, it says, if the use is in the public way, sidewalk, roadway, parking lot, it will be likely to expire at the end of the authorization period for Article 14. If it is a newly constructed patio, it would be unfair to expect a business to pay for the construction of a permanent structure and not know if they could, could continue to use it next year. They would want to know that the approval is permanent. Therefore, such constructions will generally, de will generally deemed to be permanent. Um, the last sentence saying generally deemed to be permanent, um, does that indicate like that structure would go beyond the December 31st, 2021 timeline? Rob, do you want to answer that? Yeah. Yes. Um, so one thing I just want to just um, bring to your attention is that the, the deadline that we're proposing is uh, uh, December 31st, 2021 is a deadline to actually grant the approval. So it doesn't necessarily mean everything stops at that date. It could, but it, but it doesn't have to be that way. So uh, up until that point, we can, we can consider granting an administrative approval or something that could go on for some period of time or permanently. So we, you know, we are, we are open to, for these types of uses listed in, in affected uses in the first section, we are open to both temporary solutions to deal with um, whatever uh, limitations are on occupancy or uh, HVAC systems or whatever else might be going on. And we're seeing mostly, we had seen mostly outdoor dining for that purpose. Uh, but we are also not discouraging businesses from thinking about maybe long-term permanent use for outdoor dining or uh, possibly other types of expansions or alterations uh, and, and uh, be open to hearing that under an administrative approval where it would be permanent uh, rather than uh, given a deadline to be removed or turned back to its original condition. Jack, may uh, I add to that? Yes, Chris. Um, I think there is also a, a question that Mr. McDougall raised about the difference between the right of way and private property. Um, the intention is that um, permanent structures or installations would only occur on private property and any installation that would occur in the public way is considered to be temporary because that is land owned by the public and things need to go back to the way they were. That is exactly what I meant. Thank you for clarifying. Um, and thanks, Jack. Thank you. Um, any other, I don't see any other hands from the CRC or, or planning board. Uh, whoop, Janet. Island. I have a question for Mr. Mora. Um, so you have a, so an applicant puts in an application and then you have 10 business days to approve it. How has that worked out for you? Because it looks like you must have had a quite a busy summer. And I asked that, so, and that's one question. The second question is, now that we're in a slower period of the winter, would it be useful to you to have more time to consider things, especially since their permanent structures are going in? I'm, actually, well, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. I don't know if the quality, is anyone else having trouble hearing Rob? Like it's not great sound quality. I hear him, but his video is not Choppy? matching with his, <laughs> with his voice, but. Okay, maybe that's, um, yeah, okay. Is everybody else hearing Rob? Yes. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, it, it is a very aggressive timeline to review an application, but uh, it's from a complete application. So just within other our own land use permit applications, we spend plenty of time with an applicant getting their, their ready. Uh, at that point, when the application is deemed complete, we generally, or in this case, I will at this point, uh, know a lot about the, the proposal and probably be really comfortable with it. And the 10 days might be used to finalize any uh, review and questions from Ms. Breshkrop or any other official that we need to reach out uh, to for a final comment before grant approval. So 
10 days uh, has been doable. Uh, it's, it, it is aggressive uh, and uh, it's most of the time beforehand that is uh, it, that it takes more time beforehand to prepare for an application to be deemed complete. So, so you're saying, I, I had trouble hearing you. So you're saying that it's 10 days from a complete application, but people are coming in and talking to you about how to fill it out and get everything together. And that gives you more time. Is that what you're saying? Yes, um, but we're also talking about the project itself. So we're really working and finalizing the documents of the design during that period uh, to complete the application. So there, there's often, you know, I'm, I'm working with people right now that I expect to have an application for under Article 14 sometime in the future. Uh, so there's quite a bit of time, sometimes even that go by working with designers and preparing an application and making sure it's uh, in a condition that could be considered for approval. Okay. Thanks, Janet. I, I also wanted to do, to make a motion about um, involving the public or, you know, abutters in some kind of notification. And so I've sent in um, the language and I don't know if Pam, can you pull that up or should I just read it? I'm having actually, as usual, a little trouble reading my own handwriting. So I, I'll, I'd like to make a motion to add the following sentence to the end of the first paragraph of starting application process. And then I'm having trouble seeing this. You just shrink it a little. Um, applicant shall prom prominently place notice of the application of its application with contact information for the building inspector and planning director at the main entrance of the building on a front window. Um, I can't see actually make it rid of you people. Front window, door, or siding. So I think if I get a second, then I can speak to the motion. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, what's the other public notification that, that we have going None. You know, for this? Because I'm wondering about signage and, you know, how effective that is. There's no, uh, there's no public notification because we talked about this the last time and there was none. Okay, so. It's an expedited process and there's no public notification. No public. Okay, so a sign in a window, is that going to be? Uh, is that going to make a difference, I guess, is, is, a, is a question. Uh, I see uh, Mandy. I just have a process question. Um, we're in the public hearing stage. Um, and normally, at least in council public hearings, the motions for things like that would happen after the hearing closes and we've heard from the public and all. I don't know when motions like that happen in typical planning board hearings. Um, whether it's done during the hearing or whether it's done after the hearing. Good Closes. point. I can wait. Yeah. Thank you, Mandy. I uh, withdraw my motion. What was that? I, I withdraw my motion until later. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, getting back to my so any other further questions from the board or CRC on this? And I see none and then we can uh, accept public comments at this point. All speakers should ask to be recognized by the chair, myself, and should be identify themselves by the name and street address. All questions, comments should be directed uh, to the chair, so. Do what do we, we ask, have here? Do we ask them to give their um, their address? Name and address, yes. Name Did and I address, that yes. On there? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. And so we have far, Pam. Yep. Pam Rooney. Yes. Hello, thank you. I had a question uh, to either Rob Mora or to Chris Brestrup. At what point would uh, a request for permanency 
come before the planning board? At what point does it does it um, move from Rob's uh, approval to a, a more official re review of something that is being requested for a permanent structure? Thank you. Rob, do you want to answer that? Yes. Sure. Uh, for for these uses that are identified in Article 14, uh, that would occur after the expiration date, December 31st, 2021. I think, may I, um, may I make a comment? Yes, Chris. I think what Ms. Rooney is asking is um, for things that are approved during this time period, um, is there a time after the time period is over that these things that are approved between now and December 31st of 2021, is there a time when those things would have to come back to the planning board or the zoning board of appeals? And my understanding um, is that no, the things that are approved during this time period, if they're considered to be permanent, would be then considered to be permanent and their um, approval would be um, would be recorded in our um, in our records here in town hall, um, and there wouldn't be a requirement for them to go back to the zoning board or the planning board. I think that's what Ms. Rooney was as asking. Absolutely. <laughs> so. Rob, do you have any anything further to add? Okay. Uh, Pam, do you have anything? No, that thank you. That um, that answered my question. Okay. It, it appears that there are a number of of uh, permissions that can be granted during this time period that may or may not be wonderful. Uh, additions to the town, but because of the need to move them quickly through the system, um, we hope that Mr. Mora would direct them to the attention of the planning board if they come across his desk and he feels that they do need a little more in-depth uh, review. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And I, oh, we have, all right. It's Pam. Pam's hand is. Is it still up? Could be down, right? Okay. <laughs> and, um, and then the proponent. Okay, so I think we've heard from, from Rob and, and Chris in terms of the proponent's response and final comments and questions. Okay, so um, any motion to close the hearing and uh, approve the the, uh, the it, amendment? It would just be a motion to close the hearing. Okay, all right. Any motion to close the hearing? Andrew? Make that motion. All right, second. Uh, Johanna? Yep, I'll second. Great. And any discussion? Is I'm going to, I'm just going to note as chair of CRC that this is going to be a joint motion that we'll do all 12 or okay. unless there's 11 of us as a roll call. Okay. Since it's a joint hearing, it makes sense to be one motion to close. Okay. And so we're looping you in and just want to make sure that's the CRC members have a, you know, opportunity to comment and I see none. Okay. So we can do a roll call. Um, Andrew. Approve. Doug. Aye. Tom. Aye. Janet. Aye. Uh, Maria? Approve. Joanna? Aye. And myself, approve. Uh, Mandy? Uh, yes. 
And Evan? Yes. Sarah? Yes. And Shalini? Yes. Thank you. So that looks to be 7 0 on the planning board and 4 uh, 0 on, on, for the CRC. And Mandy, what do we, anything else that you? I think now we move to general discussion, and that would be, my guess, is the time for Janet's motion and any other discussion. Okay. So, Janet? So, um, I'd like to move, um, if we can put the motion back up, um, at the end of the first paragraph of application process, the, the following language, and I'm trying to get it bigger. Um, applicant shall, prominent, shall prominently place I'm sorry, I'm getting, my screen is jumping around. Applicants shall prominently place notice of its application with contact information for the building inspector and planning director at the main entrance of the building on a front window door, front door or siding. And um, if I have a second, I'll speak to that. Um, anybody want to second that? The motion, Andrew? I'll second the motion. Okay. Thank you. So when this article first came around, I was very concerned about the fact that abutters, um, not just property owners within 300 feet, but business, small businesses within 300 feet and residents, because a lot of the you know, buildings might have um, people living upstairs, would have no notice that anything was happening. They wouldn't know that there was you know, outdoor seating coming in or sidewalks are being moved or tents put up and um, they just would have no idea what's coming at them and they would have no way of participating in the decision making process which is not our normal and um, that concern did not prevail and article 14 was passed and um, I think that we're in different times like I think in the summer the, the urgency was there to get tents up and seating in and tables put out and you know the duty barriers and everything to you know because the summer is a short time i think now that we're into the winter and there's going to be obvi obviously less um need or um people applying for outdoor seating or tents that we um you know it's still urgent but it's not as urgent it's you know and i think we have time to reflect and um, at this point, the residents, business, small businesses nearby, and abutting landowners have no input into the process. Um, and, it could, and it could lead to permanent outdoor structures and dining um, forever. And so I think that people, you know, the abutters, people nearby may have ideas, concerns, issues, make a request for a change. There might be accessibility issues. People and walkers might have need more space than we think. Um, I, I trust the building commissioner and, and Christine Gresham to consider everything they can think of, but I also know that being, you know, hearing other pe people's views and um, is important. So I think we have the time now to add a change. Um, people who are, could be affected by this, you know, building permit and the change don't know what, what is happening, when it will happen and who to contact. And our town hall is closed and it's not obvious to anybody how to kind of, you know, that they should go talk to Christine Breastup or Rob Mora. Um, so I think, and, and so I, I, I tried to draft the simplest way to notify people that would involve no effort by the town staff other than maybe preparing, you know, a one page thing of saying notice. Um, and this idea of a notice was suggested by Stephen Schreiber at a CRC meeting. And it reminded me that twice in my travels in the last years I've seen in Florida and also in Colorado you drive by a house or a lot and there's this big sign that says notice you know this building you know has there's a you know has applied for the X permit and will be here on this date and they give you a little number um, at the bottom and I thought okay putting a notice that this is coming to this area this change has been requested by this company or owner 
people walking by, walking into the building will see it and they will know who to contact if they have concerns. So I try to do the simplest thing, the shortest thing. I try to work inside the 10 day um, timeline. And so that's, that's the purpose of the motion is to keep the public involved, that people affected by changes have some way to participate and comment on them and you know, maybe shape the final decision. And that's my pitch and I hope you guys can agree with me. Thanks, Janet. Um, Johanna. Um, Janet, I, I just really appreciate your digging into the details here. And I think um, to me, this seems like not very prohibitive or arduous for the applicant. And, you know, if you're a neighbor and you see the sign, you you might notice or somebody might flag it for you. And so I think this is in this, I think it's in the spirit of community engagement and expedited review that's critical right now. Those are my thoughts. Thank you, uh, Mandy. I, I know this is going to be a planning board vote and then so CRC won't have a chance to really vote on this until we get the planning board recommendation, but I thought I'd put my concerns out there right now, because maybe that can be fixed before it gets voted on. My main concern is there's no timeline for both when the notice needs placed and how long it needs to stay up there. Um, and so I'd, I, I think that would be in some sense a quote easy fix to the language, um, but it just says prominently placed notice of its application at the main entrance of the building, but it doesn't say when that notice has to go up and it doesn't say how long that notice has to be there. Um, and so I would ask the planning board consider those concerns as it looks at this language. Thanks. Well, thank you, Mindy. I forgot to start that sentence with the time of its application. And I don't know if it's gonna be a complete application. I, I assumed your application was your application. So I think, you know, you're applying to the building commissioner and the planning department and you just put notice on, on your window. And I don't think it would stay forever. It, it, it seems logical you would just take it down after the permit was issued. I tried not to put too many, like when I was thinking about this, I was doing all these kind of lawyerly like this, that, and I thought, you know, just put it up, you know, put it up and you're right, when do you have to put it up? And it's when you, at the time of your application, on the day of your application, you know, and that would, that would actually be more, more clear. So I appreciate that idea. Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, I, I would like to call on Rob, but 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 um, Cellini has her hand up. So Cellini, please. Um, I just wanted to highlight the fact that this was a concern that was brought up earlier, and for those of you who didn't attend the CRC meeting, um, I had asked uh, Rob Mara the question of how many complaints. Uh, did he hear in this process? Because this was a trial run of some sort and we had an opportunity to see what, what kind of uh, concerns would come up from abutters and so forth. And he talked about only one situation where it came up and it was um, then they responded to it in a way that it worked out for everyone. So um, I just wanted to highlight that. And uh, the second thing is, I think this seems uh, uh, like a reasonable thing to let people know and, 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 and it's not slowing down the process because my main concern earlier was that time is of essence, even though to us, it may seem that it's winter and there's no such urgency, but I know that being a small business and when there is money invested and so forth, mm -hmm. there are all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, urgencies that we may not understand. So helping them in any way, psychologically, uh, structurally, whatever way we can support, I think it's important. Uh, but this seems like it's not going to be um, um, getting in the way of any way. And I just wanted to hear maybe from Rob and Chris, if what their, uh, res they have more experience in working with the local businesses and uh, what if, if, if any concerns they have about putting a notice like this. Thank you, Shalini. Uh, Maria, be before we, we hear from Chris and, and Rob. 
Well, you're muted, Maria. Oh, sorry. I was going to ask exactly what Shalani asked, which is what do Chris and Rob think of the work involved in this? Okay. But I, I just, but before Chris and, and uh, Rob speak, I, I do, I feel like the word emergency in there uh, kind of elevates this into something that is, again, temporary and, and, and is of a, a higher order where the, you know, notifications, I think uh, I saw some communications from Rob that it's not necessitated because it's, it's a, it's a um, you know, at, at a different level, it's great that someone has a sign in there, but I'm, I'm wondering like emergency, how does notification work when you have an emergency with COVID related things? So Chris. Um, I would say that um, it's going to be some work for us to help applicants to figure out what to put in their notice because you know people who are applying for these things some of them don't even speak english so we'll probably have to work with them to come up with appropriate wording for their notice and one thing rob brought up to me which may have been addressed by the fact that he works with applicants ahead of time before they actually submit their application but the fact is that when people come to us they have an idea of what they want to do but it's not necessarily what they get approved for in the end and it could change substantially um, even the location of it could change so um, whatever the notice says may not actually reflect clearly what is eventually permitted and rob may have more ability to talk about this because he's worked with the applicants and i i've really been kind of at arm's length from this process Rob? Yeah, I, I, th I think, you know, a lot does happen from when we, you know, the initial contact with the applicant, but oftentimes that's not the, the moment when we're receiving an application. Uh, I think, you know, there's a, a couple of good things um, about this discussion. I think that will help um, establishing that, you know, it, it be at the time of the application uh, is helpful to the language that I saw earlier. Um, I think the expectation would be more uh, that this is a notice as a courtesy to the abutters, but maybe not so much. Um, it may not be an opportunity for uh, an abutter to um, have a, a part in the decision making process. It may, but I don't think that's a guarantee depending on the timing uh, and our availability. Uh, if, if you did decide to move forward with this, I think I would propose that we would, and this isn't part of the, the bylaw material, but I think we would put a template notice in the application package where it's a, a very simple fill in this information and a brief description of the project. I think it can be very simple. Uh, and I would probably have like a checkbox on the application that this has been posted uh, and, and maybe even ask for a date that it's been posted just so we can confirm it, but probably not go much further than that. Uh, so I think, I think it's nicely done as a simple solution. Uh, if, if, uh, the notice, uh, piece of it is desirable. Um, and I, and I not really worried about the time that it might, uh, you know, how much time it would affect us in, done in this way. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Um, any other comment from planning board or the CRC on this? Johanna? Sorry, I, um, I can't remember. Was it Shalini who said that to date with all the different kind of temporary structures and emergency requests, there's been one instance where there's been a concern? Or yeah, and then that was worked out because I'm just trying to figure out. I don't know. Are we, are we inventing a problem that doesn't exist? I think to some extent we'd be heading off problems by just making sure that this is in place. But I'm, you know, kind of I understand the emergency nature, and I'm I'm just trying to 
yeah, I, I still think it doesn't strike me as super arduous, but I, I, I'd love to know, you know, whether we're coming up with a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. Should uh, Shalini speak to that? And also Mr. Moore raised no. his Moore. hand as well. Yeah. I oh, think I Rob is the person to answer okay, that. Okay, Rob. Clearly. All right, Rob. Uh, I, I think she was referencing a comment I may have made in, in a prior meeting when asked about uh, what type of complaints we've received uh, during all this time with, uh, you know, everything we've done with uh, moving dining out onto the public way, uh, private uh, property expansions of outdoor activities, uh, and, a, and a couple of the more permanent installations. And I've only received one one complaint. Uh, most of our feedback is very positive. I mean, we, we are pretty actively out there uh, trying to help all the businesses any way we can. And you can see that with what, what's been done with, uh, with the dining and the heaters and all of that. So we're pretty visible out there helping. Uh, so we haven't, I haven't heard a lot of complaints. The one complaint I did receive that I mentioned during that meeting was when we set the Jersey barriers and took away part of the bike lane on South Pleasant Street. Uh, and, and that was a complaint I received. And now, as you probably have seen that that's been corrected uh, with some restriping and, and reestablishing the, the bike lane. Uh, but we are a complaint response type of uh, department. That's how we are designed for uh, more for residential rental property type situations. Uh, so anyone who calls does get a response, uh, whether it's through COVID uh, hotline or directly to our office, all, all the complaints and concerns uh, get a, a very immediate response, usually within a short period of time within the same day. Thank you. And Chris? Um, I just wanted to say that um, now that Rob Mora has made the suggestion of having a template in the application packet and having the applicant fill it out, um, and posting and taking responsibility for posting it. That means that the planning department doesn't have responsibility for that. And that yeah. um, makes me feel better about this uh, re recommendation or this suggestion of, of Janet's. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Joanna, is your hand still up or is that an artifact? An artifact. Okay. <laughs> uh, Janet. So um, I know that your the inspectional services is super responsive to complaints. My concern is that nobody would know how to get to you or that there's a problem. And so um, I actually like most of the changes are made too, but I also think that if, you know, say me somebody in the second or third floor above a restaurant may have trouble hearing their client if they're talking to their clients and that might become annoying noise and you might just kind of sit with it but you may, you may, it might be annoying and you don't say anything. And so it's not, I'm not trying to drive complaints to the, the, to the town, but I think that people, you know, I, I can, it's hard to figure out how to connect with anybody. And here we're just giving people notice, this is coming. Here's the people you can talk to um, if you have concerns, you know, that kind of thing. And so, I mean, we're in a really hard time to connect. Like I've been wanting to return a book to Christine and I'm trying to think of like, oh, when I'm going to wait till I have to sign a decision to take, I don't want to take up her time. Most people don't even know who to talk to in the town and it's really hard to do that. And so I think it'd be amazing if there's only one person that's been irked by this change. And, I, you know, but I think that there are probably more people out there or people who'd prefer to have been a little more input in the process and this change could have helped me, but I'm not complaining now kind of thing. So I'm not trying to drive complaints to you, but I think that people just don't really know how to get to, to the government right now. I, I guess, um, just given, again, this is like uh, amendment driven by an emergency situation, I would think some people would, you know, in that situation, Janet, that they would have some empathy that, you know, this is what this is all about. And I, I would, I would think there'd be some tolerance uh, for such clients that you mentioned, but that's just me. Uh, Andrew. Thanks, Jack. Um, I, I think it's a great suggestion. I agree uh, with what Rob laid out in terms of this being an opportunity um, for really kind of having some more visibility. Um, when you think about the folks who are putting these signs up, I mean, they're, they're 
they're asking for the seating many of these folks may be like just barely hanging on to their business right so like if i'm going through town and if i see that sign i might you know maybe i'm maybe i'm more compelled to to go there right if i'm trying to make a choice of where to eat and i see that somebody is really is really suffering then even if it's a 10 day head start it's probably still a great idea so i i really i think this is a wonderful uh proposal just just for that visibility if nothing else thank you uh mandy yeah i was just gonna say um I think it's good. I, I would like to see some language added, like at the time of application and for no less than 10 days or something, because I know Rob has 10 days to approve it to the beginning of that phrase. But I think we need to also remember that part of the concern for a lack of notice that this bylaw has right now is that these aren't only just temporary grants sometimes. And uh, we heard it from the public commenter during the hearing. We've heard it um, as a lot of questions both in town council and in these hearings and these discussions that some of these grants can be permanent grants that will not show up back to the planning board or the ZBA for any public review. And so I think the solution Janet has found to that concern um, is a good one. So uh, Mandy, so you, so right now it reads applicant shall permanently place notice of its application and you mentioned um uh, you know i i'm not days. sure i can make a motion to amend because this is really going to be a planning board vote <laughs> okay. but but if i could it it would be something like adding the phrase to the beginning of that sentence adding the phrase at the time of application and for no less than 10 days okay thank you did you get that chris pam mm -hmm. all right so does um, Janet want to amend her motion to include that? Janet? Yes, yes I do. I, okay. I'd like to move to amend by adding the phrase at the time of its application and for no less than 10 days, comma, and then just go. Thank you. I second that uh, motion. This is Johanna. Great. Thank you, Johanna. Um, any other discussion? And do we need to public comment on this, this point? It's like there isn't any. No, okay. once the hearing closes, public comment Good isn't work. necessary. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so we can uh, do roll call at this point. And this is just the planning board, correct? Yes. So, uh, Andrew? Approve. Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Janet? Aye. Maria? Yes. And myself, yes. So that is 7-0 in uh, approval for the amendment uh, with, with uh, Janet's motion. Johanna. I, <laughs> What? Where's Johanna? I'm, oh, way down there. You're below everybody else. I'm sorry. <laughs> no it's problem. vexing. This, this, uh, the Brady Bunch, you know, uh, all right. So sorry. My apologies, Johanna. Um, I approve. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. So good. And uh, Mandy. So I guess the question yeah. is, was that an approval of the motion to amend the am amendment or was that an approval of the whole phrase? I Number think the one. Approval, approval of the whole phrase okay. and the amendment. Okay. And so I think your next order of business is to move to recommend the council amend that, that motion. I see. Okay. So... Do we have a motion? Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll move. Uh, Do you want me to try and read a potential motion? Oh, yeah, please. That would be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I'm not on the planning board, someone else is going to have to make it. It's moved that to, to recommend the town council amend zoning bylaw article. Hold on, let me find the right one. Article 14, temporary zoning. Yeah. 
as shown in the document named, I, I'm not sure what the name of the document is. Um, I have those, Mandy, if you want to okay. hold on one sec. Just added into the motion <laughs> and, okay. and revised on November 4th, 2020 to make it effective until December 31, 2021, add office park and professional research park zoning districts as permitted zoning districts, medical uses as affected uses, add a definition of temporary use, add a notice provision, and add several uses to the affected uses for temporary use. Um, and further, the planning board states in accordance with Charter Section 9.8G, that these amendments are not inconsistent with the master plan. Can you send that language to Pam and me? Pam's got it up on the screen. It's option one. The only thing I added was the phrase and revised on 11 4 2020. Okay. After the name of the document, because it was just revised tonight. So it's the option one motion with that extra phrase. Thank you. Oh, and I added the and a, add a notice provision too. So I, Pam, I will send you the final. That would be great. Uh, we need to write a um, memo to the town council cool. that I believe is due no later than Friday. So we need to button this up pretty quickly. So whatever help you can give us to make our work go smoothly and more easily would be helpful. And I see Mr. Marshall has his hand raised. Yes, Doug. Yeah, I, I think you need somebody from the planning board to make the motion that Mandy just read. Oh, so yeah. I'm offering to make that motion. Great. Um, any, anyone want to second that? Tom? I'll second. Okay, so uh, I can do a roll call. Or discussion? I see none. Okay. So, um, uh, Andrew? Proof. Doug? Aye. Um, Janet? Proof. And, oh my God, the, the names are bouncing around here. So, <laughs> I apologize. Um, uh, well, I'm going to hit Johanna because I, I skipped here. So, Johanna. I approve. Maria. Approve. Janet, did I get you? Yes. yes. Okay, you're, you're good. Uh, Tom we, Long. Tom. All right. Approve. And myself approve. Okay, so that is done. That's 7 0. Mm hmm. So and I think, I think now it's the CRC's turn. There you go. All right. So I am going to look for a motion from a CRC member to recommend the town council amend zoning bylaw article 14 temporary zoning as shown in the document named article 14 temporary zoning amended temporary zoning regarding permitting for certain uses during the COVID-19 emergency and its aftermath and revised on 11 4 2020 to make it effective until December 31, 2021, add office park and professional research park zoning districts as permitted zoning districts, medical uses as affected uses, add a definition of temporary use, add a notice provision, and add several uses to the affected uses for temporary uses. Is there a motion from a CRC member? So moved, Evan. Evan moves, is there a second? Sarah second. Sarah seconds. Is there any further discussion? Shalini. Mandy, Joe, can you clarify whether this, I mean, I'm sorry, I missed the first part. Did it include the notice thing change? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. It does? It does because okay. the planning board amended that document before it made its recommendation. Okay. Okay, great. And then um, my follow up question is, can we still, we'll still count the first reading when we meet, or is this going to delay it in any way? So it, 
the amendment will not delay the first reading or the second reading um, because we're allowed to amend things even after they've been posted on the bulletin board. <laughs> the first okay. reading will still happen on this coming Monday, the, is that the okay. 9th? Cool. Um, I think that's the 9th. And then the second reading on the 16th. Okay. Thank you. And I, actually, I will, nope. if it gets amended, I will let Athena know tonight mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. update the bulletin board. Thank you. Also, can I just make a statement? It's not related to this, but it was in the planning board. Someone said that the Zoom link was not available. It was not easily available to attend the planning board meeting. And I just wanted to clarify that that's there on the calendar on the homepage of Amherst Town, the calendar. And if you click on the planning board meeting on the calendar itself, there's a link to the Zoom meeting. So I'm just clarifying because people could not find the access to the Zoom link. Just talking about accessibility. So thank you, Shalane. You're welcome. Any other discussion? Seeing none, we will come to a vote. It will be by roll call. We're going to start, I think I'm the next in order. So Mandy is a yes. Um, Evan. Yes. Uh, Sarah. Yes. And Shalini. Yes. That is unanimous with one absent. So I think now I get to go to the rest of my meeting, which is items not anticipated by the chair. I don't have any. If I don't see any hands for CRC members to have any. And so I, before I close, I want to thank Rob and Chris and the planning board for hosting CRC tonight for the joint hearing and getting us through it um, and the motions. Again, the first reading at town council will be this coming Monday, the 9th. Uh, the meeting starts at 630. I don't know when we will get to the actual discussion of this bylaw that probably won't happen until at least 730 or later. Um, and then the second reading, if all goes well, will be the 16th. Um, and that would also be when a vote occurs. Um, and with that, um, Chris, did you want to say something before I join the meeting? I just so wanted to confirm that Mandy Jo will send um, the new wording of the um, amendment, Article 14, to Athena. And that I won't be um, doing that. Mandy Joe is going to do that. Is that I correct? will do that tonight once the meeting is finished. I'll, I'll, I'll copy you, Chris and Pam and Rob on that um, okay. so that you guys all have it. Um, but I will send, and I will send the motion language to Pam and, and you, Chris. Thanks. And with that, I thank you, planning board. We're going to, I'm going to adjourn the CRC portion of the meeting. Thank you, Mandy. At nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. And the rest of uh, CRC. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. So, Pam, I don't know if you want to wipe that out. Article 14. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good. There good. you go. All there right. You go. Chair so, Jensen. now uh, what did we skip? All right. So, we got Emily, we got Article 14 done, and now we're looking at Applebrook, plus her subdivision. We did so, that. We did that, Jack. We did? Yes. We did. Yes. Okay, yes. we oh, we fit that in. That's right. Uh, so now 40R, um, and we have, it's nine o'clock. We've been at two, two and a half hours in, um, and this is, this is a broad, uh, subject that uh, <laughs> I'm not sure uh, how much we want to get into this. And then also we have the master plan implementation as new business. Um, I'm, I'm open to suggestions in terms of, you know, directing the, the last, what I would hope the last half hour of this meeting. Jack. If, yes, Doug. We did, we did the master plan implementation update because Chris gave her update on the work that she and I are doing on the spreadsheet. Right. 
Oh, that was brief. All right, that was very brief. All right, nothing more. Okay. We'll so, put that on the agenda for the next meeting so you can have more of a discussion about that if you want. Okay. To. All right. So I guess that brings us to 40R. Um, and that is, that is, you know, just a topic that we're trying to follow up with regard to the last forum. Um, there was some interest and then uh, who do we have in the attendees? Cause I know we talked about Rob Crowner and they unfortunately and, have left, Mr. Yeah, Crowner. so I think I, I guess I I would suggest we 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 push that. I mean, the, the, this is the the meeting again, two and a half hours in, and forty hours, you know, kind of conceptual in nature. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really want to take that on right now, but I hopefully, you know, if anyone has any questions about it. Um, Mr. Marshall has his hand raised. Ms. Okay. has her hand raised. All right. Uh, yes. So, so go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I wanted to ask when uh, Chris thinks the consultants might have their final report with the revised bylaw that they were that they had drafted back in May, so that we have a more coherent product to talk about rather than you know we have the bylaw that was done back in may and then we have the presentation that was done in october but you know that presentation doesn't seem to reflect everything that some of uh rob crowner's responses said would be fixed so i think it'd be great to just have a com single consolidated, you know, coherent product for us to talk about. Um, I don't know when the consultants are planning to have the work done, but I, I think it's going to be very soon because I believe they worked on it over the weekend and they've been working on it this week. And they, um, you know, took into account uh, Janet McGowan's comments and they took into account Rob Crowner's comments following that. So um, I would just, I don't really know when they're going to have it, but I would assume that it's within a few weeks. Um, we could put it on an agenda for November 18th, um, which is the next planning board agenda. The only thing I have for that agenda so far is um, a new building that's proposed on the UMass campus for the Newman Center. And um, they're required to come and show us the drawings uh, for what they're proposing. There's no permit process because it's within the ED zoning district. So you could have a, a discussion about 40R that night, um, which by that time you may in fact have a product. Um, so do you want me to put, put it on the agenda for that night? I, yeah, please. And I want to thank Janet for her, her comments, very detailed um, per usual. Thank you, Janet. And, you know, again, we asked Rob to, to chime in and, you know, this is all good. It's all for, you know, betterment of, um, you know, the town and, and, you know, our vision for, for downtown. And um, I, I just, I, the, you know, I just, I'm just thinking that we're, we're, we're confronted with so many things with COVID um, and businesses closing and, and then, you know, housing issues, and we, we, we get information from, uh, you know, the school committee or, or uh, uh, school administrator, Mike Morris, that, you know, our, our student population is going below a certain, you know, threshold that further, uh, you know, harms the, the town's ability to to uh, finance our existing school system, which so many people move to the area to to uh, you know participate in and and, and uh, you know so is there, <laughs> uh, I'm I'm very concerned about what's 
going to happen, you know, within the next, you know, months and year from what we've seen. So uh, this 40R thing will be a very good discussion for us uh, uh, to have amongst the board. And with that said, I would, I would Jack, just say, like per Ryan, if you guys read Rob's comment, sorry for speaking out of order, but hopefully we don't have any five story gas stations or nuclear power plants or whatever he had <laughs> called out in there. Let's, let's. Only in your backyard, Andrew. That's, <laughs> that's it. That's. <laughs> so we were going to talk about Bruce Carson's letter if we're finished talking about 40R for now. Okay, um, I'm bringing up, let me bring up the agenda. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm kind of trying to go digital. I know I have paper in front of me, but um, give me one second. Okay. Um, Just to bring it to the attention of the board, yes. send the letter to the board and when the board is considering um, zoning amendments, um, the board may wish to consider the things that uh, Bruce Carson mentioned in his letter. Um, Oops. They're things that came out of a project that's being proposed at the corner of Strong Street and um, East Pleasant. And um, it's, a, it's a proposal to um, create a converted dwelling out of a, an existing garage building. And many um, residents have uh, expressed concern about it. It's going before the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, but this letter is uh, specifically about the issue of resident manager. And that topic isn't really addressed in the zoning bylaw. So um, it, isn't well, it, it isn't well addressed in the zoning bylaw. So Mr. Carson is bringing this to the Planning Board's attention um, in hopes that the planning board will consider um, more um, clear language with regard to what exactly is meant by a resident manager with regard to some of these um, rental units that are non-owner occupied. And you can certainly, you know, discuss this tonight if you want to, but we just wanted to bring it to your attention tonight. And then if you would like, we can put it on the agenda for a future meeting. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, th this really brings up uh, a lot in terms of like, you know, planning board making recommendations to the town council to, to with regard to critical issues, you know, within the town. This is, this is a great example that I'd like for us to wrestle with a little bit. And I'd like to end this meeting you know, in 20 minutes, so so we have 10 minutes of discussion maybe before we go through the the uh, our our uh, our committee you know reports. Um, but this is the sort of thing that we're talking about in terms of planning board being able to discuss and be, you know, in lieu of not having the uh, zoning subcommittee. This is this is I think will be real you know productive for us to advance and, and um, you know, personally, I, you know, my daughter is moving 45 minutes away because she can't find housing <laughs> uh, with her, you know, husband and twins, you know, in, in the Amherst area, uh, which, you know, just brings it right home to me that, you know, we have issues and, and those issues are because, you know, housing and, and rental housing going to student you know, population that then that whole ball of wax. So, uh, Andrew. Um, yeah, I was, I was, thank you, Jack. I was only going to say that I have not had a, this is a, the letter that came out earlier this afternoon. Is that right, Chris? Yeah. Yes. yeah. I was just going to say, I haven't had a chance to re review it. Um, so if you did want to talk about it, I, I, I wouldn't be able to really fully participate. Um, I think the intent tonight was really just to bring it to your attention and to let Mr. Carson know that the planning board has seen the letter and that you will consider this um, at a future date. That sounds good to me. Just just wanted to make sure. Mm -hmm. And and sort of in this in this uh, whole concept, I mean, I've, I've you know, and 40R, 
I'm just, you know, in terms of like af affordable housing, getting young families into town, uh, someone brought to my attention this residential exemption. It's not in the purview of planning board, but when it comes to, you know, our taxes, how do we make it easier for owner occupied, you know, homes to, to, you know, meet the, the, um, you know, municipal sort of, you know, property taxes, et cetera, versus people that are developers that are, you know, renters and that sort of thing. And, and this residential exemption thing was brought to my attention. And I get, I think that there's like 12 towns in Massachusetts that participate in this uh, thing that, and then there's, uh, I guess it's MGL chapter 59, section 5C that, that allows it maybe, you know, Janet, I know you're, you're pretty good at this sort of thing, but I, you know, it's not our purview, but I'm wondering with the news that, that we got from, uh, from, uh, Mike Morris that, you know, we're, we're, our student population is going below a threshold, um, that we're, we're losing money, uh, ability to gain money because our, the student, our, our schools don't have ad adequate, uh, um, you know, population there. It's like, you know, it's just like a catch-22 situation. Janet? So um, I one thing that comes to mind um, and this is in one of the, I think the housing production plan or the other, um, the um, Amherst housing market study is you can require that students can't be in housing. So, you know, this is just literally off the top of my head. If you say the, the living resident, you know, the manager cannot be an undergraduate student, can't be a student, you know, because I think, you know, what, what Bruce, um, Carson is identifying is like a huge loophole. And so, you know, any, you know, I can, I can picture a very responsible college student being a very good resident manager to his roommates and the, the people, the students next door. I just don't think it's probably a great idea in the long run over time with lots of people. And so, you know, there, we can say no undergraduates, we could say no students. And so, um, you know, and make some space for um, non-student housing in town. Because I think, especially with UMass adding so many students in the last decade, I think it's a huge amount of pressure on the lower income houses, the cheaper houses, um, the neighborhoods that are, you know, with, with more ranches are converting more and more to student housing. And in the study, it says that kind of goes back and forth. You know, sometimes it's, you know, a lot of families are buying, sometimes lots of, you know, developers or, um, landlords are buying, but I think in the last 10 years with 4,000 more students in the area and the pressure is going to be on those lower priced units or to convert a garage, you know, we, we thought, oh, you're going to convert a garage, but it's owner occupied and then there's no owner and then it's college students or the rental managers. So it seems like a slippery slope and we can just put something in there. It just says, you know, a, the rental manager cannot be a student, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I remember, Creating some space, you know. Yeah, I, re I remember discussing with with uh, folks in the planning department. I, I and I I felt like that that wasn't possible to kind of restrict it at that level. But maybe by the tax property tax option is yeah. is is more viable than you know trying to put it in, uh, you know, restrict is there. So so the property owner if they live there, uh, then they would be able to file an amendment or uh, uh, abatement. an application, abatement. And they, you know, so they would get, you know, like say 20% off of their taxes. And, um, you know, so it, it's complicated, but there are like 12, you know, a dozen towns in Massachusetts that do this, Nantucket, a uh, bunch of towns, Boston, number one, but another, yeah, so it's just something, it, it, and it's not in our purview, but we could recommend that. But it's this, this you know, Bruce's uh, um, request here kind of just brought it to mind, and and 
you know, also, if you want to encourage people to convert and build more housing out of garages or, you know, sheds or buildings and, you know, to build support in the town, you don't want, you don't want to have eight undergraduates in a house and then the garage living, you know, like that could really turn your neighborhood. And so I think we should think, I think we have to talk about the undergraduates and the impact on neighborhoods. Some of, in North Amherst, some of the neighborhoods, it's really had a very negative impact. But I think the, the tax abatement you're talking about is also a really powerful tool to make um, owner-occupied, you know, multi-units much more attractive to people. Yes. It's not, I, it's not a big market here, but, you know, those, those units are really sought after in the cities because they're great deals for people, you know, to have a few rental units and yeah. live there. Uh, Doug? Yeah, I wondered if uh, between now and the next meeting, anybody was thinking of coming back to us with a proposed alteration to the, the text of the bylaw so that we could use that as a starting point for a conversation. Uh, I don't know if that's something that Chris's, Chris or her staff would have time for, if so, or if somebody maybe on the board who no longer has to go to zoning subcommittee meetings uh, might want to take on and, and come back to us with. Or, or somebody that's new to the board and is really looking to <laughs> cut their chop. Yep. No, I, I just, I feel like with, with the COVID, you know, we have this Article 14, you know, businesses, you know, lack of students, lack of town revenue. I, I'm I'm really concerned, and I just want our the planning board to help the town to the extent that we can with regard to recommendations. So um, I'm just I'm really I'm I'm really worried about our town right now. Um. So, uh, Tom. Yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm just wondering if, you know, with with a set of questions in mind, if, you know, that's something that we do spend time, maybe not so much writing said bylaw, Doug, but um, thinking, thinking about, uh, you know, how we might propose language or what areas uh, we think changing language might help um, going forward. And that way we can have a, a more robust discussion about whether you know, there's room in 40R for that. Are there other things that we need to start to address and, you know, how we can make recommendations and proposals and put things into action that we're not doing yet. So, you know, maybe finding space in our agenda for in the next meeting um, and homework being, you know, doing some, some, some thinking and writing and research on that ourselves. So uh, I would ask like Chris, you know, can you work with me, you know, on the, for the next agenda that we can kind of like, it sounds like the next meeting will will be a little bit, you know, light. light side, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe we can you know take this up and and, and talk about the 40R in a little more detail, um, and you know have Rob and and John Hordick uh, present, um, and yeah, because these things this weigh heavy on on my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> Doug? And we're going to talk about this resident manager definition. That's what my comment a minute ago was about. That would be, yeah, getting into the specifics, yes. So, um, so I will consult with Rob Mora. He's more used to dealing with the resident manager issue because the Zoning Board of Appeals is the board that normally takes up this kind of application. So um, I'll speak with him about if he has any suggestions for language. So uh, this was kind of a uh, little tangent off the 40 hour, I guess, but for old business topics, not reasonably anticipated 40 hours, 40 hours prior to the meeting. That was Bruce's letter. I'm sorry I brought it up. Uh, to you, I guess. <laughs> uh, and nothing else. No. Okay, good. So new business, uh, we talked about the master plan implementation. We'll 
carry that on. Uh, and then anything else, new business? Nope. Chris, okay. Uh, form? Form A's. A and R? No form A's tonight. All right, great, great. Upcoming ZBA applications? Pam would know about that. There is, but I should be scolded because um, I don't remember it. <laughs> so I will have to report it to you at the next one. Chris, do you remember it? I was going to make it a slide, and I got so busy doing other ones that I forgot. Sorry, I don't remember it. All I remember is that there is this case before the ZBA now about the converted garage, but I don't remember any other cases. That is the one, the converted garage. Converted garage at the corner of East Pleasant Street and um, Strong Street. So that yeah. um, is going before the ZBA, but I think there's been a request to continue that public hearing till January. Um, but I will, I would like to announce to the planning board the good news that the Zoning Board of Appeals approved the comprehensive permit 40B. That's awesome. For 132 Northampton Road. And we're very happy about that. Um, I think we in the department feel that that's a really good project. And we worked hard with the Zoning Board to help them to um, get all the information they needed. And I think that they came up with a really good decision and good conditions. There are almost a hundred conditions. Um, and we had a good lawyer working with us from KP Law, John Witten. And um, so it, it turned out really well, but I think there were probably eight to 10 public hearing sessions. So it was, it was a long process, but I think the result was very worthwhile. I should have saved that for the report of the staff, shouldn't I? <laughs> I can put it in there, Chris. ZBA thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I try to attend some of those hearings and then, you know, but my gosh, that is laborious sort of yep. approval process. So, so kudos <laughs> to, uh, you know, the Valley CDC getting that through. Um. And then we can go uh, upcoming SVP, SPR, S, uh, SUB applications. None that I know of. No, okay. there are other things out there, but none that I know of. Good. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking of, you know, Pioneer uh, Valley uh, Planning Commission report that I kind of I uh, uh, punted on uh, the last <laughs> meeting, and. Um, you know, I'm wondering if I just should send, you know, a report to you that you can distribute, Chris, mm -hmm. because, um, an email would be good. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I, I'm, I'm into the weeds there and I, I don't, I can't really give a, a brief synopsis. So, but, so I'll do that and then you can, uh, uh, distribute. How's that? Good. Yep. Okay. Nothing earth shaking as far as I know, <laughs> but I, I would like everyone to be aware of what's going on. So, uh, and then uh, Community Preservation Act. Yeah, Andrew. thanks, Jack. Uh, we meet tomorrow, uh, be our, our third session. We've got four more proposals we're gonna hear from. Great. And Ag Commission, any news on that? I think Doug's appointment has not yet been finalized, oh. unless he's heard something different. But I wouldn't okay. be surprised if they take care of that at the next uh, town council meeting. They seem to be doing them little by little. All right. Maybe, well. I'm, maybe I'm too controversial. Should I withdraw? <laughs> <laughs> you have that great background in your picture. Yeah. So. Yeah, we should send a it, snapshot of that to the town council. <laughs> yeah, as long as Doug, as long as you can, like keep that background, you're kind of like in contention, I think. <laughs> uh, uh, design review board, Tom. Yeah, we had I actually had a meeting today um, at five, so I've been on here for <laughs> oh, a long time. Um, oh my. 
So, uh, and I, ha I had to leave early, so that was fun. Um, so there are two things that we're viewing. Uh, one was um, a, they received a grant, um, and I'm sure Chris knows some of the details of this, about um, they're going to use for funding for bus stops downtown, sort of bus stops in area or bus shelters um, in areas that currently don't have them. Uh, one in front of St. Bridget's on North Pleasant near Cole Street and um, one on South Pleasant by Spring Street right across from the Common or basically right across from the other bus stop, the Peter Pan stop. Um, and then as well possibly replace the bus stop on the corner of Maine and South Pleasant. So again, by the parking lot there. So um, they're uh, trying to get them to match in line with the existing ones that are across the street. So using the same aesthetics uh, for those. So that's pretty simple stuff. Um, and then uh, I was, I had to leave before any conversation or detailed debate, which I was hoping to get an update on. I didn't. Um, there is a proposal for a new kind of digital wayfinding system for town, sort of updating people on news and events and programming. Um, some electronic charging stations for people's phones and devices as well was part of this package. Um, it wasn't going too great <laughs> the moment I left. Um, so I'll probably have, it, they're, they're very um, contemporary signage systems and they didn't match very well with some of the existing systems in place or match with our proposed um, uh, signage and wayfinding system. So there was a little conflict there. So um, I'll have an update on that next time. So to let people know, this is part of the CARES Act funding. Correct. It's not money that's um, being, um, authorized or appropriated by the town. It's money from the government to help us to um, emerge from COVID-19 and um, the communications manager and the town manager have come up with this idea. It's called SUFA signs. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's S-O-O-F-A signs. And um, Janet may be familiar with them because I think they have them in Somerville. Um, so oh. anyway, just wanted to mention that. I have a question. Yes. Yes. Janet. So in terms of the bus stops, is there any way to make them fun and kind of arty instead of just generic kind of city-like? Um, yeah, I think about well, this. So yes and no. So part of the discussion was that there's a lot of different things that are happening already um, and that they're totally uncoordinated. And so hence the signage that came up, the SUFA signs was also a thing that felt uncoordinated. And the suggestion was to merely just match the ones that are across the street. From, yeah. Yeah. Rather than do something different that kind of draws more attention to a new thing. But I do think that there is room to start thinking about some other things that might stand out. But those are things that wanted to disappear like right in front of St. Bridget's Church there was the design review board was not very happy that there was a thing that might block a photo. So, the, so I think they yeah. want to kind of disappear um, at least the bus stops themselves. So, um, but I do agree that there are other opportunities. The nice thing about art is it doesn't have, it, you don't really want it to coordinate, but I could, I could see you want maybe that being invisible, but sometimes I thought it might be just take it in a different direction. Yeah, no, so I agree. Something about the bus stops. The bus stops are another thing that's being paid for by a grant. It's the um, Mass uh, D Department of Transportation grant that we received for shared streets and sidewalks. I think it is. Anyway, um, we have to spend the money by December 31st or they take it back. So we're in a big hurry to get this um, approved, get these bus shelters um, agreed to, where they're going, what they're going to look like, and go ahead and buy them. And then, you know, Maybe we'll end up with more than we actually need and we can think about where to put some more in the future. But for a couple of them, we really want to nail it down and we have a very short time frame to do that. So I just wanted to share that with you. Andrew? Chris, can I just real quick, are, does, is the town responsible for those or, or PBTA? 
most of the time the PVTA is responsible for them. I think the, the town puts them in, but PVTA buys them. Um, in this case, um, since we had this opportunity to get new ones, and some of the ones we have are pretty old, um, we thought that would be a, a good thing to do. And um, so it was part of the shared streets and, and sidewalks um, grant opportunity that we had. And some, some of those may have digital um, information that updates on bus time schedules and whether they're on time and bus routes and things like that. So it's also part of um, figuring out where those go and whether we can afford to do all of them is a question. PBTA would um, manage those going forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and the zoning subcommittee, I assume that is, uh, you know, no issues, but, uh, and the report of the chair, I just want to, you know, circle back to Amherst Hills and the paving. It seems like that's going to happen within the next week or two based on a recent communication. Is that correct, Chris? So it seems. We'll okay. It when we see it, but so it seems. All right. So let's keep, you know, keeping our eye on that. And then um, I think I had a conversation with one of the, the um, someone uh, <laughs> with regard to what's going on with Spring Street, you know, in terms of the construction there. It, it seems like it might have been halted. And I guess, you know, there's be some, you know, concern that be that doesn't progress. So, but I know in the age of COVID, it would be nice to get a report, I think, on the progress. I will ask Rob what he knows about that. Okay. And that's all I have. Now, yeah, oh, Andrew, Andrew has his hand up. Yeah, thanks. I was just wondering, does anybody know, um, you know the the tent we approved at the Jones Library. I see the structure there. One of my one of my kids indicated that it may have blown off, like the covering may have blown off of that. Does anybody know what happened there? If if that happened or not? I haven't heard that. But okay. it did. The the day after that big windstorm, it wasn't there. Okay. It, yeah. I think that was maybe the the rumor on the the school zooms, perhaps. But um, all right. I might have taken it down to avoid the windstorm. Yeah. That's not back up though, so. You know, I, I mean, on that topic, all the structures that we talked about with, you know, at the high school and the tents, there's one at Crocker Farm that I walk under pretty much every day. <laughs> I don't know what people are thinking, you know, with these tents and are they, <laughs> I don't know that they're ever, have been, they will be used. Um, it's It's unfortunate, but. Um, well, if Article 14 passes, then you won't ever have to have this come before you again. It'll be yeah. in the realm of the town uh, of the building commissioner. Yeah. I mean, that's more of a school issue that, and again, they've delayed, you know, student mm -hmm. attendance uh, at the, uh, you know, but they were thinking warm weather, uh, obviously, but. Um, um, so, uh, report of staff. I already gave my report about the ZBA approving um, the 40B application for the Valley CDC at 132 Northampton Road. So. Oh, okay. And so we can adjourn. 936. And we're meeting, what, the, the 18th? The 18th. Okay. Yep. Right. All right. Good. So thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank and you. Thanks, Pam, you. for holding us together. Pam, you, you were stellar. Thank you so much. But I, <laughs> I had to report my own faux pas. How often is that? <laughs> all right. Well, good all night. Right. Good, good night, night everybody. Bye-bye.